giant beasts dragging U-boats to their doom. A mysterious superweapon attacking America from the skies. And the dirty Nazi secrets of Britain's ruling classes. Conflict on a scale never seen before or since. A new kind of war. This is war at its weirdest. Bizarre experimental weapons. Mysterious events. Conspiracies and cover-ups. When governments destroy files, you can't help but wonder why. Unexplained phenomena. The RAF doesn't have an explanation for the crew's report. When a world goes to war with itself, things get weird. In World War I, a German U-boat commander reports an encounter with a giant sea monster. This creature was dragging the U-boat underwater. They shot at it, but it had no effect on it whatsoever. This is not the first or last time the gigantic sea creature is spotted. There are things in the ocean that we're only just finding out about. Has war at sea brought to the surface ancient creatures of the deep? The First World War is a new kind of war. In the air, on land, and at sea. It's the first time submarines are used as an effective instrument of war. For Germany, the U-boat is like a whole new wonder weapon. But of course, for the crew and the commanders on board, it's an introduction to this weird new underwater world. And for many sea creatures, it's their first close encounter with humans. The Germans send dozens of U-boats to the Atlantic, where they prove devastatingly effective, cutting off enemy supplies and sinking thousands of Allied ships, among them the world's largest passenger ship, the Lusitania. More than 20 U-boats are patrolling the waters around Britain, and they're sinking, on average, two ships per day. They openly attack neutral American ships, supplying Britain and the Allies. The Germans are using their U-boat to deadly effect. The U-boat was a nightmare for merchant shipping, but was almost as scary for the U-boat crews themselves. These small submarines were incredibly cramped piping and chemicals and the diesel engines creating noxious fumes. It must have been just awful to be in one of these things. The effectiveness of the hunter-killer U-boats in turn makes them a priority target for Allied warships. And the prospect of being trapped underwater with no means of escape was terrifying. But more frightening still is the strange creature allegedly encountered by the crew of U-Boat 28. <laughs> 30th of July, 1915. U-Boat 28 is circling the waters off the Irish coast, looking for its next victim. On the horizon, it sees the British cargo steamer, the SS Iberian. U-28 moves in for the kill. U-boat 28 hits it with torpedoes below the waterline and with gunfire above. The steamer sinks so quickly it drags crew members down into the ocean to their death. 25 seconds later, there is a great explosion beneath the waves as the Iberian's massive boilers explode. Debris is thrown to the surface, 
And that's not all. The captain of U-28, Commander George Gunther von Forstner, said that from the foaming sea, a gigantic sea monster rises up, towering and writhing above the waves. The creature had four large webbed feet, a pointed head, and a massive tail. This was a creature adapted for swimming in the deep. Sailors who've worked these waters have passed down many strange stories of terrifying monsters swallowing ships. For centuries, Irish sailors have told tales of a creature called Beast Kion, which literally means the beast with a black head. The U-boat crew's report of a giant sea creature might seem incredible, but it's not the only sighting. This is one of the many instances during the Great War when unknown sea creatures have been observed and documented by military personnel. 30th of April, 1918. The Royal Navy convoy sloop Coriopsis is patrolling the waters of Northern Ireland. Suddenly, the British crew spot a German U-boat drifting defenseless on the surface of the water in broad daylight. This is highly unusual. U-boats are stealthy killers. They rarely surface during the day in enemy waters. The stricken floating U-boat is one of Germany's elite UB-85 submarines. Normally, U-boats instill fear in the Royal Navy. But in this instance, when spotted, they're floundering. Something's not right. So the Royal Navy approaches. The British vessel powers towards the U-boat, ready to engage. But as it does, the hatch opens. The U-boat crew is spilling out of the ship, leaping into the ocean and swimming desperately towards the sloop. The British have no idea what's happening. It's a completely chaotic scene. The British help the crew out of the water and take the U-boat's captain, Gunther Kretsch, to be interrogated by their officers. The commander's story is incredible. Kretsch tells the British officers that the previous evening he'd surfaced to recharge the batteries and allow his men to have a smoke. When out of nowhere, this strange creature surfaces from the sea and begins to attack the boat. Kretsch describes the beast as having huge eyes set into a horny head with teeth that glistened in the moonlight. The U-boat captain's account doesn't end there. Kretsch states that the sea monster rises from the ocean, wraps part of its body around the forward gun mount, dragging the U-boat down and causing it to list dangerously. According to Kretsch, the officers riddle the beast with pistol fire, and then eventually it releases its grip. Kretsch says that the monster inflicted such damage on the U-boat, it was then impossible for them to submerge. As you can imagine, the crew was only too pleased to see a Royal Navy ship come to protect them. Could the creature that allegedly attacked the U-boat be the same monster described by old Irish mariners? How do we explain the giant sea creatures encountered by these U-boat crews? If it is, then it's an animal of a scale and nature unknown to modern science. Coming up, the Jurassic monster that time forgot. The coelacanths have lived for probably 350 million years, and in that time they have changed but little. The First World War heralds a new kind of naval warfare. Novel underwater boats attacking enemy ships from beneath the waves. But in the North Atlantic, a number of Navy submarine crews are reporting having been attacked by a terrifying creature. One such encounter was described by Royal Navy Commander Captain F.W. Dean. May 1917. Captain Dean's warship, HMS Hillary, is patrolling the waters of Iceland, 800 miles north of Ireland. 
Out of the still ocean, the British naval officer sees a huge serpent-like creature rise from the water. It appears to have a black, glossy head, supported by a 20-foot neck. And as his ship passes, it, it seems to raise its head out of the water, as if it's observing them. Captain Dean orders his men to shoot the serpent with six-pound artillery guns. The serpent takes a direct hit and then disappears without trace. The creature resembles the sea monster Bisht Kion, described in Irish sailors' folklore. Mythical monsters are only mythical until they're found. Sea creatures, once thought the stuff of sailors' tales, have only recently been proved to exist. The colossal squid was long thought to be just a legend. But the legend was proved true when a New Zealand fisherman managed to land one off the coast of Antarctica in 2007. Colossal squid can reach up to 50 feet in length. Maybe that's just big enough to grab a U-boat and scare the heck out of the crew. But the monsters described in the World War I reports don't resemble a colossal squid, or indeed any other creature known to marine biologists today. Could a squid really damage a metal submarine? Unlikely. It is not impossible that naval warfare in the Atlantic has brought to the surface an animal as yet unknown to marine biologists. In 1938, a giant armored coelacanth fish was discovered off the African coast. Scientists were astonished. This creature was supposed to have died out 65 million years ago. The coelacanths have lived for probably 350 million years and in that time, they have changed but little. This seven-foot armoured-plated fish lived alongside the dinosaurs. Could the U-boats have disturbed and then been attacked by some Jurassic sea monster such as the Thalatosuchian? Which, just like the Coelacanth, scientists have long thought to be extinct. 95% of the world's vast oceans remain unexplored. Well, these accounts of sightings of monsters at sea may have some truth in them. For now, the weird encounters of these World War I U-boats remain unexplained. Strange objects in the skies above America Bizarre reports of unexplained explosions. One American family has been blown to bits. The US government orders a complete press blackout. Only a few people know what's really going on. Mysterious objects falling from the sky, threatening devastation and mass hysteria. If this information gets out, panic will spread across the whole of America. Fifth of May, 1945, Oregon. American pastor Archie Mitchell and his pregnant wife Elsie take five children from their local Sunday school on a trip to Gearheart Mountain. As Archie unloads the car, Elsie and the children head off to explore the surrounding woods. One of the children spots this weird metallic object in the undergrowth and says to Elsie, look at this. Elsie then goes back to her husband and tells him. They're the last words she'll ever say. Archie hears a massive explosion. He turns around, runs into the forest, only to find a huge blast crater and the scattered remains of his pregnant wife and the five children. The police come, but they're soon joined at the scene by government agents and military observers. The police are told by the agents not to report the incident, and also the witnesses and the families are made to stay silent as well. The six deaths are followed by more sightings of strange metal objects. A 
close inspection of the unexploded devices quickly reveals who might have made them. These things have Japanese writing on them. But it's a mystery how these things got here. The Americans have been expecting for a long time a large military strike from Japan. But of course it's thousands of miles away uh, across the Pacific Ocean. Seventh of December, 1941. Three years before the appearance of these weird incendiary devices, hundreds of Japanese fighter planes launch an attack on Pearl Harbor Naval Base in Hawaii. The Americans are taken by surprise. It's quite astonishing. In just over two hours, the Japanese destroyed 20 warships, 180 airplanes, and kill over 2,000 servicemen. Effectively, the Americans were sitting ducks. The Japanese air attack was only possible because its carrier fleet could sneak within range of the Hawaiian coast. But at the time of Pearl Harbor, Japan's bombers only had a range of about 1,400 kilometers. And of course, the Pacific Ocean, you know, Japan to America is 10,000 kilometers. And US planes weren't much better themselves. Pearl Harbor pulls America into the war. In retaliation, America plans its own surprise attack on Japan. But the question is, how to strike an enemy more than 6,000 miles across the Pacific Ocean? It was too far away from mainland United States to send planes over in the normal manner in which you would bomb a country. One man comes up with a daring plan. The Maverick Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle set about adapting 16 B-25 bombers to be launched from the deck of USS Hornet. America's brand new B-25 Mitchell bomber is deemed the best plane for the mission. But it is too heavy to take off from the runway of even America's biggest aircraft carrier. So the bombers have to be stripped down to the bare essentials, even sacrificing gun turrets and radios to get them in the air. The planes took off close enough to reach Japan and launched the first ever air raid on Japanese soil. Japan is about to have its own Pearl Harbor. The Japanese were amazed when American bombers appeared over Tokyo. Such an attack was thought impossible. They were taken completely by surprise. The Americans target military and industrial sites. But worse still than the damage to Tokyo is the blow to Japanese morale. It was a public humiliation for the arrogant imperial regime. The Japanese want revenge. They want to hit America where it hurts. But the Japanese have a problem. Even if they adopt the same strategy as the Americans, the US military would now expect such an attack. The Americans are on high alert. Any ship crossing the Pacific is going to be a sitting duck. So how can they hit America without risking their own fleet? The Japanese have got to find a way of transporting a bomb across US-controlled waters without the Americans noticing. The Japanese come up with an ingenious plan to use the jet stream. The jet stream, a high altitude, fast moving wind that travels from west to east, from Japan to America. Japan's military wants to harness the power of nature to transport bomb carrying hydrogen balloons all the way to America. A Japanese meteorologist called Wasaburu Oishi gives the Japanese the know-how how to turn the jet stream into what is effectively a conveyor belt of death. This was not the first time that hydrogen-filled bombers had been used. Enormous airships called Zeppelins were used to bomb Britain during the early stages of the First World War, and the sight of these airships caused absolute terror amongst the population. But the gigantic airships were easy targets for British fighter pilots. The Japanese attack balloons, known as Fugos, will be a far more terrifying weapon. They were going to fly higher than any plane. They were going to be unmanned. And they were going to be sent over to America in their thousands. 
and six miles up in the sky, there will be nothing America can do to stop them. Coming up, America is under siege as the deadly waves of Fugos descend silently from the skies. They've got no idea where the balloons are coming from, and they've got no idea where the next balloon is going to land. The Japanese plan attacks on America in retaliation for the devastating Doolittle raids on Tokyo. Japan is now itching to exact its own revenge. Their secret wonder weapon? A device to rain terror on America, sent across the Pacific on the jet stream. They were going to be sent to America in the thousands. The Japanese call their bomb balloons Fugos the wind ship weapon. The jet stream, moving at 200 miles an hour. It would carry the Fugos at speed to Western America. Cities would be set ablaze. Suburbs terrorized. Whole forests would burn to the ground as the Fugos rained down on the US. These could be the first intercontinental missiles the world has ever seen. Japanese scientists set to work. The first challenge is the jet stream itself, which occupies only a thin layer of the upper atmosphere. The problem was how to keep them at a constant altitude so that they could reach the United States and then deliver their deadly payload. The Japanese develop an ingenious ballast system, which responds to air pressure. At night, as the balloons cool down and they start to fall, the change in air pressure triggers the system. Bags of sand are released, causing the balloons to rise. During the day, as the Fugos warm up and start to rise, air pressure triggers a series of vents to release hydrogen, which lowers the balloons. Each balloon was filled with a precise amount of hydrogen so that they would descend when they reached their targets. Air pressure gauges sense proximity to the ground, then trigger the bomb fuses. Now it's a question of numbers. To cause chaos across America, the Fugo has to be mass-produced. But in wartime Japan, materials like cotton were in short supply. And synthetic nylon was a recent American invention. So the Japanese turned to paper to make the 33-foot balloons. For centuries, they had produced so-called washi paper from the Mitsumata shrub, known in the West as the paper mulberry tree. This paper is plentiful used to make everything from umbrellas to the internal walls of houses. But manpower is in short supply. Thousands of women and schoolgirls are conscripted into the laborious task of producing the balloons. But the workers are starving. They are guarded closely so they don't steal and eat the edible potato paste used to glue the balloons. Japanese meteorologists pick the best time of year to launch the first Fugo balloons. At the start of November 1944, the Japanese released the fire balloons. And they do it at this time because that is when the jet stream is at its strongest. The test balloons reach the United States as planned, but the damage they cause is limited. The Japanese have failed to account for the American weather. In summer, western forests and farmland are as dry as tinder. A powder keg ready to ignite. But the winters are cold and wet. By the time the Fugos arrive, the wildfire season has long finished. But the Fugos cause confusion and alarm in the US security and defense agencies. The origin of these weird firebombs is unknown. Between Japan and the US sits the Pacific Ocean. 
For the US military, it was inconceivable that these firebombs could have come all the way from Japan. They're totally baffled. They can't just appear from nowhere. It's thought the bombs might be the work of Japanese Americans being held in internment camps, or else have been launched from Japanese submarines off the west coast of America. Either way, American security agencies act quickly. To prevent panic from spreading, the authorities decide that news of the firebombs must be kept from the American public. The American government issues a press blackout. But while FBI agents are sent out to hush up the first Fugo attacks, over in Japan, a giant wave of 9,000 Fugo balloon bombs is being launched into the jet stream. American and Canadian fighter pilots have been charged with intercepting Fugos, which at this point are suspected to be coming from Japanese submarines. When the first Fugos hit America, there is a state of alert. A Fugo lands at the perimeter of the secret facility where scientists are building the atom bombs that will soon be dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. For the American government, this is a real guessing game. They've got no idea where the balloons are coming from, and they've got no idea where the next balloon is going to land. 2,700 troops and 300 paratroopers are deployed to fight Fugo fires on America's west coast. Operation Firefly has begun. The perilous job of fighting forest fires and disarming bombs falls to the African-American 555th, otherwise known as the Triple Nickels. America's first all-African-American parachute infantry battalion. America at the time is extremely racist. The troops are segregated from their white comrades. These men were trailblazers. They paved the way for countless black soldiers to follow. The obvious bravery of the African-American troops helps bring about the desegregation of America's armed forces shortly after the war. The Fugos that do get through mostly land outside urban areas, and there is little damage caused. Back in Tokyo, Japanese High Command are anxious for news of their supposedly devastating wonder weapon. Japanese intelligence closely monitored the US press, hoping to hear of disastrous explosions, death and destruction. But they hear nothing. The propaganda boost that they're hoping for never materializes. Because of the press silence in America, Japan does not have a clue whether these firebombs are working or not. In Tokyo, it is assumed that the balloons have failed to reach their target. In April 1945, just as temperatures are starting to rise again in the US, the Japanese decide to scrap Operation Fugo. Four months later, America devastates Japan with its own secret weapon, effectively ending the Second World War. Out of the 9,000 launched, only 285 Fugos were discovered on American soil. Countless Fugo death traps may still lie hidden across Western America. Scientists believe that 1,000 fire balloons still litter North America. In forests and underneath farmlands and in other locations around the coast, they're still down there, they're still potentially incredibly dangerous, and there's every chance in the years ahead that they could blow up more American families. The only known victims of the Fugos were Elsie Mitchell and the five Sunday school children. They were the only Americans killed in combat on continental American soil in World War II. Less than a year into the Second World War, Hitler has the British army at his mercy. Over 300,000 men are about to be captured by the German army. 
This could signal the end of the war for Britain. But then, Hitler issues one of the weirdest orders of World War II. It's illogical, it's militarily crazy. Why did he do it? Why did he stop his forces? To crush the British army might have secured victory for the Nazis in World War II. And yet, to the dismay of his generals, it seems Hitler deliberately allows the British army to escape. Hitler's bizarre decision in April 1940 not to capture and defeat Britain's army in Europe has baffled historians for decades. Was Hitler following the crazy advice of some occultist astrologer? Was he high on crystal meth? Was this a simple act of lunacy? Or does it reveal something deeper and even more bizarre? A secret alliance between the Nazis and Britain's ruling class. Within five weeks of the outbreak of war with Germany, Britain has sent 158,000 men to France and more than 25,000 vehicles, including tanks. The Allies outnumber the Germans. They have more tanks than the Germans. But they're under the control of the aging French general, Maurice Gamelin. Gamelin expects to fight the Second World War just as he fought the First. He's preparing for a long, drawn-out conflict. But the Wehrmacht has other ideas. Their troops and panzer tanks move at lightning speed. They make concentrated attacks and are supported from above by a new kind of warplane, the Stucker dive bomber. Hitler has developed this new style of warfare, blitzkrieg warfare, very fast, very mobile. The British have no time to dig trenches, and by the time they realize what's going on, the Germans are almost on top of them. Spearheaded by the brilliant tank commander, Erwin Rommel, the Germans sweep through France. They as good as defeat the French army and corner the British. It would seem that the German blitzkrieg armies are unstoppable. The whole British army retreat to the coastal town of Dunkirk. They are surrounded. It looks as though they're going to need a miracle to escape. And as if by divine intervention, they get one. As the panzers prepare to move in for the kill, Hitler issues one of the weirdest orders of World War II. He tells the German tanks to stop in their tracks, and this decision arguably costs Hitler the entire war. So why does he do it? Coming up... Hitler's right-hand man goes to drastic lengths to form an alliance with Britain. Churchill has a problem. Members of his own cabinet want to make peace with Hitler. <laughs> Dunkirk. Hitler has Britain on the ropes. But he orders his troops to halt their attack. German generals on the ground cannot understand why they're being stopped at this critical juncture. Hitler's generals were furious. This was their opportunity to finally deliver the fatal blow to Britain's forces, and Hitler stops them from doing it. The British army is completely surrounded. Churchill needs to get his men out of France. The British Admiralty springs into action. Destroyers, minesweepers, ferries, pleasure boats, all sorts of ships make their way across the channel to bring home the British army. As if by divine intervention, the notoriously rough English Channel falls as calm as a summer pond. On this stormy sea, not a ripple is seen. An unlikely armada of ordinary citizens bring their boats to ports and harbours all around the south coast and take them over to Dunkirk. Fishing boats, lifeboats, cockle ships, they go over and they withdraw these men, pull them back and rescue them from under the noses of the Germans. Hitler doesn't know it, but this move will cost him the war. 
Hitler's decision to let the army get away would come back to haunt him. Four years later, some of the soldiers who escaped from Dunkirk would return to France at D-Day. This time, they were more experienced and out for revenge. Why, the despairing German generals asked, has Hitler made this bizarre decision? And historians have been asking the same question ever since. It's a mystery. Why did Hitler stop his tanks? Was Hitler taking advice from occultist astrologers? Senior Nazis like Himmler, Hess, and the Nazi theorist Alfred Rosenberg championed superstitious pagan mysticism over Christian morality. Rosenberg even called for crucifixes to be replaced by pagan-inspired swastikas. And in Mein Kampf, Hitler expresses his hatred for Jewish religion and Christianity. But few historians believe that Hitler was driven by mere superstition. Is it possible Hitler was high on drugs? It is known that throughout the conflict, German troops were routinely issued with mind-altering substances, the World War II equivalent of crystal meth, which induced intense bursts of energy and fearlessness, as well as psychosis and aggressive behavior. It now seems that Hitler was being given the same drug. Theodor Morel was Hitler's doctor, and as the war progressed, he was doping Hitler ever more heavily. And this may partly account for Hitler's uncontrollable fits of rage, confusion, and paranoia. But Hitler's decision to let the British army get away was taken too early in the war for drugs to be the reason. At the start of the war, Hitler was really in pretty good health. The irrational mood swings we associate with drug addiction don't really start happening until the tail end of the war. Lacking obvious answers, historians begin to wonder whether Hitler had some other secret motive for halting his troops at Dunkirk. It doesn't seem logical. If Hitler orders a halt, it would allow the British to escape. There's got to be some underlying reason why he did it. The real reason for Hitler's weird halt order may be one of the best kept secrets of Britain's aristocracy. By the 1930s, many British aristocrats were attracted to fascism. Modern liberal democracy had undermined their traditional role as Britain's hereditary ruling class. And like Germany's landed nobility, they blamed their declining fortunes and indebtedness on industrialization and Jewish financiers. Hitler and Mussolini offered new hope, a militaristic fascist state that would tame capitalism and restore them to their former glory. But in truth, many aristocrats were sympathetic to the fascists. Baronet Oswald Mosley set up the British Union of Fascists. Lord Keynes, the famous economist and friend of Mosley's, expressed admiration for fascist Germany. Edward, the Duke of Windsor, was one of the British aristocrats who paid fawning visits to Hitler and gave Nazi salutes. Neville Chamberlain, who until Dunkirk had been prime minister, was openly anti-Semitic and appointed fascist apologists into his government. Hitler regarded Britain's ruling class as his potential friends. He was really flattered by their attention, and he even wrote very favorably about the British Empire in Mein Kampf. How far did this affect Hitler's decision to spare the British army at Dunkirk? At this point in the war, it is possible that Hitler was actively trying to make peace with Britain, maybe even to form an alliance. If that is the case, he might have believed that it was in Germany's best interest to spare the British army. Subsequent events support this theory. On May the 10th, 1941, a Messerschmitt takes off from a German airfield in the dead of night and heads towards Scotland. It is flown by a former World War I pilot, Hitler's second in command, Deputy Führer Rudolf Hess. No one is a closer confidant of Adolf Hitler than his right-hand man, Rudolf Hess. Hess's destination is the private airstrip of the Duke of Hamilton at Dungavel Castle. 
Hamilton had met Hess in Germany and had promoted closer ties with the Nazis. But Hess misses the target. Hess couldn't find the airstrip, so just outside Glasgow, he ditches his plane and parachutes down to Earth. On landing, he sprains his ankle. He's caught by a local labourer who hands him over to the Home Guard, who arrest him. The local man who caught Hess is filmed for the newsreels. Yes, I'm the man that captured Rudolf Hess. Little did I realise at the time the important man he turned out to be. The next day, the Duke visits Hess. Hess tells Hamilton that he's here to broker a peace deal with Britain. He puts an incredible offer on the table. If Britain accepts Nazi expansion eastwards, the Nazis will respect the British Empire. Effectively, an alliance between Britain and Nazi Germany. Is Hess acting alone, as he claims? Or was he following orders from the Fuhrer? It seems inconceivable that Hess acted without Hitler's knowledge. Ever since Hess joined the fledgling Nazi party in 1920, he idolized Hitler. He even helped him to write the Nazi manifesto Mein Kampf in prison. Hess had remained at Hitler's side ever since. In 2011, historian Matthias Uhl discovers a 28-page handwritten document written by Karl-Heinz Pinch, Hess's assistant. Pinch was the man who had the unenviable job of telling Hitler that Hess had flown to Britain. But according to this document, Hitler wasn't even vaguely surprised. You would think, if you were Hitler, and you just heard that your right-hand man had flown to the enemy, you would have some reaction. Pinch says that when he tells Hitler about Hess's mission, the Führer calmly dismisses him without a word. He also says that Hitler appears to be well aware of Hess's flight. For many Nazi sympathizers in the British ruling class, it is an attractive offer. And Churchill comes under pressure from them to meet Hess. Churchill has a problem. Members of his own cabinet want to make peace with Hitler. But though many British aristocrats admire the Nazis, the British public hates them. Mosley's fascists are attacked by crowds of angry locals when they try to march in London's East End. Anti-Nazi newspapers see their circulation soar. Churchill understands the anti-Nazi mood in Britain. Churchill's not called the British bulldog for nothing. He tells them he would rather go down choking in his own blood than make peace with this mad and evil dictator. Churchill would rather go to the cinema than discuss a truce with the Nazis. He tells Hamilton, Hess or no Hess, I'm going to see the Marx Brothers. Hitler goes on the offensive. He moves into damage limitation mode. He strips Hess of all his ranks. He declares that he was suffering from hallucinations and was mentally disordered. Rudolf Hess is arrested and in 1945 convicted by the First International War Crimes Tribunal in Nuremberg, Germany. He is sentenced to a life of total solitude as the only inmate in Spandau prison, where he spends the next 40 years. Hess was never able to discuss the incident again. No historian or journalist was ever able to interview him. The man who assisted Hitler in writing Mein Kampf hanged himself in prison, age 93. To this day, debate still rages about Hess's very mysterious mission. Was he acting on his own, or did he have Hitler's blessing? Support for the Nazis among Britain's upper classes is still a cause of embarrassment. And the reason for Hitler's weird decision to let the British army go remains unknown. In many ways, it still seems like this episode in the war is as weird now as when it happened. Strange glowing spheres in the wartime skies defy explanation. America's top secret vampire squadron. A mystery mass grave and World War II whodunit and the Tommy Torturers, Britain's secret SS. Conflict on a scale never seen before or since. 
a new kind of war. This is war at its weirdest. Bizarre experimental weapons. Mysterious events. Conspiracies and cover-ups. When governments destroy files, you can't help but wonder why. Unexplained phenomena. The RAF doesn't have an explanation for the crew's report. When a world goes to war with itself, things get weird. <laughs> a series of close encounters with floating glowing spheres. These are highly experienced pilots, and they don't know what they're seeing. The British government launches an urgent investigation. Could these be alien craft of some sort? Winter 1942. Despite the early success of Operation Barbarossa, Hitler's invasion of Russia is coming to a bloody and disastrous end at the Battle of Stalingrad. There's fierce fighting in Stalingrad, there's fierce fighting in North Africa, there's a great struggle for air superiority in Europe. Uh, the whole future is in the balance. At the beginning of October, Germany successfully launches a rocket, Aggregat 4, later known as the V-2. It is the first ever man-made object to reach space. The Nazis are on their knees, but there's a rumor they're developing a new kind of wonder weapon that can change the whole course of the war. A few weeks after the Germans reach space, RAF pilot PC Lumsden is flying over the English Channel in his hurricane for a mission over occupied France. He is flying at 7,000 feet. Suddenly, he sees something. Two orange spheres of glowing light moving steadily towards his plane. He immediately thinks, well, of course, it has to be tracer flat. What else could it be? But then he realizes, no, hang on, it's moving too slow. It's like nothing he's ever seen before. Whatever these things are, Lumsden tries to shake them off sending his fighter into a dizzying sequence of spins and turns. But the mysterious spheres have no difficulty following his every move. Whatever these lights are, they're still on his tail. Frightened and confused, Lumsden plunges his hurricane into a hair-raising 4,000 feet nosedive, accelerating to 260 miles per hour. He manages to pull out of the dive. The glowing spheres have gone. On his return to base, Lumsden reports the incident, but his story is dismissed. At first, no one believes him, but then other pilots start reporting the same thing. So now the authorities have to take it seriously. The number of reported sightings starts to multiply. It's not just individuals, entire squadrons purport to have seen them. One famous sighting involves America's elite 415th Night Fighter Squadron. As the night fighters are flying over Germany, around 10 luminous spheres appear, as if out of nowhere. The floating objects surround the plane and move among them. They're moving independently, under their own control. The orbs of light are so bright, they illuminate the skies around the aircraft. Fearing that they are under attack, the onboard radar operators are told to check their screens, but there's nothing showing up. These mysterious balls of light seem to be undetectable by radar. This is a special ops night fighter squadron. They're not about to run. This pilot steers the aircraft directly at the glowing balls of light, and they vanish. A few moments later, they reappear, but in a different location. The unexplained lights follow the squadron for another six or seven minutes, and then they vanish. It's like these balls are intelligent. They seem to anticipate the pilot's next move. As even more sightings are reported, word spreads about the bizarre hovering orbs of light. The pilots and crews give them a name, taken from a popular American comic strip. There was this cartoon character whose catchphrase was, 
Where there's foo, there's fire. And this is what the Americans start calling them, the Foo Fighters. American and British authorities need to find a plausible explanation for the Foo Fighters. Some people suggest that the pilots who've seen these things may have had one French cognac too many, but even teetotalers have seen them as well. US Navy doctors Ashton Grabiel and Brant Clark conduct an experiment on pilots to see if the Foo Fighters are mere tricks of the light. You put the pilot in a dark room and then you shine a pinpoint of light in his eyes and then you ask him, what's it doing? Disorientated in the dark room and with no other visual references, many subjects report the light to be moving. In fact, the light's not moving at all. It's standing perfectly still. This is a visual illusion. The doctors call this illusion autokinesis. It's this false movement of a light source caused by autokinesis that Grey Beetle cites as the most likely cause for Foo Fighters. Grey Beetle subjects other pilots to his test with similar results. But there are problems with his theory. For a start, it doesn't explain where the lights are coming from. The Foo Fighters don't look like the lights in Grey Beetle's tests. They're bigger and they're brighter and they zip all over the sky. What's more, when the Foo Fighters appear, there are often multiple witnesses. Surely they can't all be imagining it. So you've really got to ask yourself, if there are these lights in the sky, then where are they coming from? This led some to look to nature for an explanation. Could the glowing orbs be examples of a rare and little understood atmospheric disturbance known to meteorologists as ball lightning? Ball lightning is one of those unexplained phenomena that just won't go away. People report seeing it, but scientists can't explain it. Ball lightning can appear during or just after lightning strikes. The spheres are typically the size of a grapefruit, but can be as big as a beach ball. They are white, yellow, orange, red or blue in colour. And just like the Foo Fighters, they appear and disappear without a trace. But there is a major difference. Though it has been seen in or around planes, it's most typically observed on the ground. Ball lightning has been reported to fly down chimneys and pass through walls. It's also been observed near aircraft, but doesn't last more than a few seconds. It's extremely rare and has never been seen in clusters. But Foo Fighters often come in numbers and travel alongside aircraft for as long as 10 minutes. So whatever a Foo Fighter is, it's not ball lightning. The British authorities ordered their own investigation by the Air Ministry's Operation Research Section. The investigation is entitled Recent Enemy Pyrotechnic Activity Over Germany. What the British want to know is could this be a secret Nazi wonder weapon? As the war turns against the Nazis, Hitler begins to pin his hopes on futuristic weapons developed by his rocket scientists. They call these sinister inventions Wunderwaffen. The most extraordinary is the new V2 rocket, the first man-made object ever to leave Earth's atmosphere. The V-2 was developed by some of the very same Nazi scientists who would later help NASA put a man on the moon. The Foo Fighters start to appear at the same time as the launch of the first ever V-2 rocket, but they cannot themselves be V-2s. V-2s travel well in excess of the speed of sound. They don't slow down and they don't hover. So you actually have to ask yourself, could the Nazis have developed another type of wonder weapon, one that behaves exactly like the Foo Fighters? The Nazis were rumoured to be trying to develop aircrafts that had vertical takeoff and landing capabilities. A programme to develop a bell-shaped aircraft was said to have made a significant breakthrough. A central cockpit was surrounded by rotating adjustable wing vanes, which gave the aircraft lift. Fifteen prototypes were built. This was not the only wonder weapon. According to some investigators, Nazi scientists also developed an airborne drone known as a Feuerball. A jet-propelled pilotless flying disc 
It was fitted with electromagnetic charges to play havoc with an enemy's aircraft's electrical systems, jamming radar and even stalling engines. But no such interference was ever reported by pilots encountering Foo Fighters. There are no collisions, no breakdowns, no ill effects of any kind from having a Foo Fighter on the end of your wing. So if this was a top secret German weapon, it was a pretty lame one. The Foo Fighters, it seems, cannot be explained by any technology known to exist at the time. Why couldn't this be extraterrestrial activity? Why couldn't they be checking out what we're doing down here on planet Earth and why we're fighting? At the time of the Foo Fighter encounters, the term UFO hasn't even been coined yet. But as the war ends and Nazi technology ushers in a new space age, the possibility of life beyond Earth captures the public's imagination. Files declassified by the British government in 2010 refer to an alleged sighting by an Allied reconnaissance aircrew returning from France. The airmen say that they've seen this weird metallic object that appears to hover noiselessly by their plane and then disappear without a trace. In the declassified report, Churchill and US President General Eisenhower are said to have discussed the encounter. According to hearsay, Churchill declared that the incident should be classified for at least 50 years because he feared a mass panic. But these claims have never been officially confirmed. It was generally the case that before 1967, all UFO files were destroyed after five years. So if there was a record, we're never going to find it. When governments destroy files, you can't help but wonder why. Reports of Foo Fighters remain among the weirdest events of the war. The Foo Fighters ultimately remain unexplained. 2008. Construction workers digging foundations in a Polish town make a terrifying discovery. There are over 2,000 bodies in this one pit. This secret mass grave lay hidden for 70 years. Was this another atrocity carried out against the Jews by Nazi execution squads? But the authorities struggle to find an answer. Who are these people and what happened to them? Most of the bodies show no sign of a violent death. Who these people were is a mystery. October 2008. Malborg, northern Poland. Laborers are digging foundations for a luxury hotel next to one of Poland's biggest tourist attractions, the town's 13th century castle of the Teutonic Order. But as they dig down, they make a gruesome discovery. A human skeleton is embedded in the earth with what appears to be a bullet hole in its skull. Heavy rain causes more of the earth to fall away, and hundreds more skeletons are exposed. Everywhere the workers look, there are bones. Appalling atrocities took place in this region during the Second World War. In some areas, the majority of the population were ethnic Germans, but minorities were persecuted. Within days of the German invasion on the 5th of September, 1939, the SS shot more than a 1,000 Poles and Jews in the town of Bedotsk, which is not far from Malbork in East Prussia, then known by its German name, Marienburg. The Nazis carried out horrific war crimes in this area, and within eight weeks, they have burnt down 530 towns and villages and murdered most of their populations. To the Nazis, Jews and Slavs were untermenschen, subhuman, and Lebensenbürter's Leben, unworthy of life. Heinrich Himmler wanted the Poles to be decimated. It was a brutal chapter of the war. In 1945, when Allied forces sweep across German-occupied Europe, the horrifying scale of the Nazis' grotesque crimes is exposed. 
The Nazis systematically exterminated thousands of innocent victims. This was murder on an industrial scale, and there was simply no denying what they had done. The mass graves of their victims were simply too big to conceal. And yet in 2008, investigators examining the newly found mass grave can find no historic accounts of such an atrocity having taken place in Malbork. When they speak to the local townspeople, no one has any knowledge of a massacre. No stories have been handed down, not even any rumours. The vast majority are women and children, very few men. But who were they and when did they die? It seems incredible that 2,000 bodies can be buried in a single mass grave and there's no one who can tell us how they died. Was? I am going to leave and... To begin with, it is naturally assumed that this massacre is the work of the Nazis. The Nazis' philosophy of hatred has stripped them of moral decency. Their troops murder thousands upon thousands of people. There are certainly some aspects of the site which strongly suggest that the Nazis are responsible. The corpses at the bottom of the heap have been buried naked, stripped of possessions and identifying features. There are no clothes, no identification, not even any false teeth. In the extermination camps at Auschwitz and elsewhere, victims were shaved, rings ripped from their fingers, gold teeth removed with pliers. The removal of personal effects like glasses and even dentures summons up the spirit of the extermination in the concentration camps. But there is something very strange about the mass grave discovered in Malborg. Only the top bodies look as though they've been shot. On the others, there's no sign of execution, but there were no gas chambers in this area. What's more, if these are the bodies of locals, they are likely to have been ethnic Germans not Polish victims of the Nazis. So how did they die? Could the bodies at the bottom of the pit have been victims of frostbite? The appalling effects of freezing became evident in the Arctic winter of 1941, when Hitler sent German soldiers without adequate winter clothing to fight on the Eastern Front. Those who witnessed the retreating troops were shocked. Thousands of soldiers were mutilated by the frost. They lost limbs, arms and legs. They lost their nose, their ears, even their sexual organs. But forensic investigation does not suggest frostbite is the cause of death for the bodies in the Malbork mass grave. The first clue to what really happened at Malbork comes from the grave itself. The Nazis typically forced their victims to dig their own mass grave. But crucially, the bodies at Malbork lie in a bomb crater. This is a form of mass burial more often used by the Soviets. The population of this region were not just victims of the Nazis. 17 days after the Germans invaded Poland from the west, the Soviet Union invaded from the east. Over 20,000 Polish soldiers were taken to forests and executed by the communist NKVD, the forerunners of the KGB. One Russian soldier complained he had blisters on his trigger finger from shooting poles in the back of the head. On the face of it, it looks suspiciously like the Soviets may have been to blame, but there's a lot more to this than meets the eye. When the Nazis came, many Poles and Jews were sent to the death camps. Those who remained sank into destitution. Weakened by malnutrition, they were more vulnerable to disease. The lack of soap and bad sanitation caused the spread of lice. And the lice carried typhus. Typhus thrives in unsanitary conditions. During the course of the First World War, three million people fell victim to the disease. And it's spread by lice living in clothes. That most of the bodies in the grave show no signs of violence suggests the population of Marienborg may well have fallen victim to typhus. Even so, people attempted to escape before the Russians got there. Eyewitness accounts report that there were too many women and children trying to desperately get a place on too few trains that were leaving the city before the Soviet army arrived. 
As the Soviet troops advanced, they were fearful of catching the highly infectious diseases which were rife in the region. Maybe this is what happened back in 1945, that Marienburg was in the grip of a typhus epidemic. It's believed that the Soviets may have rounded up healthy locals and forced them to strip the weakened typhus victims who were already close to death and to push them into bomb craters. One effective way to destroy typhus is to bury the dead and then to burn their infected clothes. And that effectively kills the lice and kills the germs and prevents its spread. That would explain why the bodies at the bottom of the grave were found naked. But then what would explain the bullet holes in the skulls of the bodies on the top layer? The very act of removing the clothes from the typhus victims exposes the people doing the clothes removal to the bacteria themselves, a job almost certainly given to prisoners of war. Potentially, after they'd finished that unsavory task, they turned round and saw the guns pointing at them, and they realized that because they themselves were infected with the bacteria, they were going to be executed as well. How could this Soviet atrocity have gone unreported? How did the communists succeed in concealing it? After the war, this part of East Prussia became Poland and Marienburg was renamed Malborg. The region was then subjected to decades of communist rule. Under Soviet rule, there was no free speech. The slightest word against the authorities could have extremely serious consequences. Under these conditions of terror, the communists could simply rewrite history. They were assisted in this by the Allies. The British Foreign Office, it is now known, colluded in the cover-up of communist atrocities in Eastern Europe. Even Churchill and Roosevelt were very willing to blame the Nazis for these communist outrages because they wanted to maintain their very delicate alliance with Stalin. However they died, seven decades on, the identities of the bodies found in the grave at Malbork are still unknown. The people remain the forgotten dead. A wonder weapon inspired by Hollywood horror. A crazy dentist with an even crazier plan. And a bizarre secret mission that goes horribly wrong. When the truth starts to emerge, it sounds like a horror story brought to life. A squadron of blood-sucking vampires is sent to wreak havoc on the enemy. It's the stuff of horror movies, except that it's true. Well, almost. The story begins with a mystery fire. May 15th, 1943, New Mexico. For no obvious reason, a fire breaks out at a brand new US Army flight training station. Carlsbad American Army Air Base turns into a raging inferno. The barracks, control tower, offices and hangars are all destroyed in a matter of minutes. Smoke is bellowing hundreds of feet into the air. They have no idea what's going on. Personnel are evacuated from the buildings and stare in disbelief. But the base is not under attack. This isn't some Japanese commando raid. There are no soldiers attacking the base, and no one seems to have breached security. No one can explain what's happened, and even stranger still, the base fire crews aren't even allowed in to fight the flames. It's deeply suspicious. The base is less than a year old. It has been built several miles southwest of the small town of Carlsbad in the New Mexican desert to train bomber crews for the war against Germany and Japan. The base is an obvious target for the Japanese. People are very aware of the dangers of bombing in the aftermath of the London Blitz and the attack on Pearl Harbor. So are Americans in danger? The Japanese have already demonstrated they can hit mainland America. On the evening of the 23rd of February, 1942, a Japanese submarine slips undetected towards the Santa Barbara coast. The target is the Elwood oil field. Elwood was a key oil field on the Californian coast, and it supplied the whole Santa Barbara area. And because it was so close to the sea, it made it an easy target for any Japanese naval bombardment. 
For 20 minutes, the Japanese sub is free to fire at Elwood's massive oil tanks before silently slipping away. Was the inferno at the Carlsbad Air Base the result of another Japanese submarine attack? Carlsbad is 500 miles inland, and even the Japanese didn't have weapons that powerful. Whatever caused these fires, it sure as hell wasn't a submarine. Then was this the work of Japanese agents already in the United States? The Americans are willing to believe the Japanese will do anything. President Roosevelt ordered the internment of Japanese and Japanese-American citizens. And there was no right to appeal. Once these people were put away, they were put away, because this was a time of paranoia. Was the Carlsbad fire the work of guerrilla fighters originating from the camps? On the whole, the Japanese internment camps were peaceful places, and uh, there's very few reports of people escaping or going AWOL. The Carlsbad incident remains unexplained for more than 30 years. But in 1974, a set of highly classified wartime government documents are finally released. These papers contain details of some of the weirdest secret weapons the Americans ever invented. And among them is a memo which reveals the cause of the Carlsbad Inferno. The fire was caused by an experimental weapon going completely wrong. That top secret weapon is like something from a horror movie. This was arguably the most bizarre weapon ever developed by the US military. The weapon is the brainchild of a Pennsylvanian dentist called Dr. Little Adams. Adams is outraged by the Pearl Harbor attack and devises Project X-Ray, a bizarre plan to get back at the Japanese. A squadron of terrifying killer bats. These aren't the mythical creatures, we're talking real live bats. A species known as Tadarida brasiliensis, wasp-eating free-tail bats. Adams knew that the majority of Japanese cities were made of timber-framed houses with paper walls. In other words, a fire waiting to happen. When the bats are released near buildings, they naturally seek shelter under the eaves of houses. The dentist's novel idea is to fit thousands of the tiny mammals with incendiary devices and drop them out of B-25s over Japan, spreading destruction across the country. They would burn Japan to the ground. Cities burning to the ground was a real threat in World War II. In the Blitz, the Germans destroyed a million homes in London over eight months and killed 40,000 civilians. That kind of bombardment threatened the morale of the British, so vital to keeping the war effort going. It'd take more than this to get me out of my home. America wants Japan to kowtow by destroying their cities and their morale. The USA are willing to consider any option. Adams' eccentric plan might well have come to nothing, but among his friends was the president's wife, Eleanor Roosevelt, and she then explained the plan to her husband. Adam's crazy idea is given the green light. Project X-Ray is put into motion, and the search is out for bat soldiers. The dentist visits a bat colony in caves several miles southwest of Carlsbad. Literally millions of Mexican free-tail bats nest there. They are small but strong, easily capable of carrying a dangerous incendiary device. This variety of bat flies higher than any other. And since bats are nocturnal, their altitude makes them hard to spot and hard to stop. After further research, Adams finds another cave, which serves as the perfect source for the Project X-Ray bat bombers. He has found an almost limitless supply of the right breed of the flying mammals. Adams finally finds a cave in southwest Texas with 20 to 30 million free-tailed bats. That's enough flying arsonists to burn Tokyo to the ground. 
But for the Batty plan to work, there is still one extremely tricky problem left to solve. Just think about it for a moment. You've got a live bat the size of your hand, and around this you've got to attach a detonator, half an ounce of explosive, and the timing device. This may not be rocket science, but it's just as difficult. To devise a bat bomb, the army turns to Harvard University chemist Professor Louis Fieser. Fieser knows all about starting fires. The previous year, he invented napalm. Fieser decides that napalm is perfect for the bat bombs. He pours a thickened kerosene into small celluloid sacks, and then the detonation timers and triggers are added. Each miniature firebomb is to be clipped to the loose skin on a bat's chest. They could produce a flame about a foot long, and they would burn for about eight minutes. Plenty of time to start a serious fire. Now all the team have to do is test whether this crazy idea will actually work. Containers full of bats are parachuted down from bombers, and at a certain altitude, a switch opens the cages, releasing the bats. The delivery device is another technical masterpiece. It's like a concertina which pulls open to release the bats which are stored on racks inside the bomb. They work just like a living cluster bomb, spreading many incendiary bombs over an entire neighborhood. Temperature is used to control the bats. To keep them calm in flight, they're cooled into forced hibernation. To excite them near the target, they're warmed up. The trays of bats are dropped from the planes. Timer fuses open them as they fall through the air, and the bats fly off. Now a 15-minute countdown starts. What could possibly go wrong? For the test, bats are dropped into rural American farmland wearing dummy incendiary devices. To the relief of Adams' team, the test is a huge success. The planes drop the bat bombs, the cases burst open, and the bats fly away all over the local area. They're found in barns, in farms, everywhere that's flammable. It's a huge success. If these were houses in Tokyo and the bats were armed, fires would be already raging across the city. But skeptical senior commanders want to see what happens when the bats are carrying real bombs. In makeshift labs at Carlsbad Air Base, the handlers take the bats out of the cooler. The bats are very docile and sleepy. But fitting the bombs is fiddly and it takes time. And it's very, very hot working in the New Mexico labs. And the bats quickly start to wake up. So they fetch six hibernating bats, strap bombs to them, then all hell breaks loose. One second the bats are there, and the next they're gone. Just 15 minutes later, the entire military base has gone up in flames. The officers in charge of the operation panic. Project X-Ray is top secret. If they send in fire crews, everyone will know about the bat bombs. And so, in order to keep the vampire squadron secret, this brand new army airbase is allowed to burn to the ground. For the US military, there is one consolation the bat bombs clearly work. But just as the Project X-Ray team think they've found a super weapon that will break the spirit of the Japanese, another lethal invention steals their place in history. Adam's great plan is shelved, not because it doesn't work, but because they have a more sinister and powerful approach. August 1945, the Americans drop two atomic bombs on the cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Over 100,000 people are killed immediately. Tens of thousands more would die later. Adams always maintained that his bat bombs could have worked and forced the Japanese to surrender, just like the atom bomb, but with far less tragic loss of life. Luckily for the bats, he never got the chance to find out. It was a war between good and evil. And it was kind of obvious who the bad guys were. 
It's a standard scene from a war movie. The SS officer comes in, vain, cruel, clicking his heels. The SS officer is sneering, brutal, and of course, he speaks in a thick German accent. But now imagine a slightly different scene when the SS officer comes in and speaks with a British accent. Just suppose there'd been a British SS. It goes against every image we have of the Second World War. Weird, but true. This is the true story of Hitler's secret British SS regiment. Spring 2009, Auschwitz, Birkenau. The Nazi extermination camp has been preserved, a terrifying reminder of the horrors supposedly civilized people are capable of. During routine work in the camp grounds, a historian finds something half concealed beneath the rubble. It's a piece of white celluloid and it's got writing on it in pencil. He sees that it's a list of people. 17 names are written down the left-hand side of the margin of the celluloid. Names like Osborne, Gardner, Hutton and Clark. They're obviously British names. And on the reverse, there are around 20 words, German words and English words, just simple words, day-to-day -day words. Historians from Auschwitz Museum confirm its authenticity. It could be German and date from the middle of the war. What's puzzling are the British names. A million or more innocent people were forced into the gas chambers of Auschwitz. These people were totally innocent victims. They were Jews, gypsies, homosexuals from all over Europe. But British POWs are not subjected to the same fate as other prisoners. Some of the people on the list have marks against their names. Eight of them have got a tick next to them. Although British POWs are not sent to the main extermination camp, there are a series of smaller satellite camps, including one in the town of Monowitz. Auschwitz III is a slave labor camp used by German companies like IG Farben, Siemens, and Krupp. Most of the workers there are Jews, their life expectancy at the camp is around three months. They are given barely any food and water. Many die as they stood working. Those too weak to work are sent to the main camp to be gassed. But at Auschwitz III, there are also British POWs. There are a few historical records of British prisoners being beaten up and killed by SS officers in the Nazi camps. But compared to the Jewish slave laborers working beside them, British POWs got off lightly. They received Red Cross food packages and were, at least in theory, protected by the Geneva Convention. Nazi racial prejudice also saved British POWs. Hitler's views on race were very twisted. His view of the Jews were that they were subhumans, that they were animals. In contrast, he had an overly high-blown view of the British, whom he viewed as being of the same noble, Aryan, Teutonic stock as the German race. And these views filtered down throughout the Nazi party. The supposed racial purity of the British, in Hitler's eyes, qualified them to become Nazis. This has led to speculation about the Auschwitz list of British names. Were these potential recruits for a British Nazi unit? Who were these men? It's possible this wasn't a list of people earmarked for punishment or for execution, but a list drawn up for an entirely different purpose altogether. The story of the little-known British SS begins with a young, upper-class Englishman called John Amory. John Amory was born into the British establishment. His father was at Harrow School, Winston Churchill and he was the first Lord of the Admiralty. In Britain, as in Germany, fascism seemed to appeal to down-at-heel aristocrats, looking to revive their status and fortunes. Amory fitted the bill. He had failed in business and couldn't hold down a job. John Amory was a bankrupt who moved to Paris in 1936, where he married a prostitute, 
but then couldn't afford to keep her to himself. In Paris, Amory mixed with upper-class French fascists and came up with the idea of starting a British SS division or legion. Amory proposed to the Wehrmacht a British volunteer force intended to fight the Bolsheviks. The SS were viewed as the supermen of Germany. They had to pass certain racial tests. They had to be blonde-haired, blue-eyed, physically perfect specimens. When he was told about Amory's idea, Hitler was delighted. He was fond of Britain's ruling class, some of whom he'd counted as close friends. And John Amory was the son of a leading British statesman. Unsurprisingly, the Nazi hierarchy saw in him an ideal recruiting and propaganda tool. And Amory was very happy to help out however he could. Like William Joyce, better known as Lord Haw Haw, he turned his hand to propaganda broadcasts for Germany. He, he appealed to Britons to, to fight the real enemy, communism. The Legion of St. George, later called the British Free Corps, was formed. An SS division to be made up of British officers and men with fascist views. To find volunteers for his British SS unit, Amory is given access to POW camps in Nazi-occupied Europe. Amory starts touring prisoner of war camps, and there he shares his anti-Semitic views with British POWs. Amory first addresses British POWs at the Saint-Denis POW camp outside Paris, but the British soldiers treat him with contempt. They despise him, they jeer at him, they use his propaganda sheets as toilet paper. Amory visits camp after camp, but from thousands of POWs, manages to entice just four people to join him. To help Amory raise men, the Nazis built comparatively luxurious POW camps, where the British prisoners of war were subjected to non-stop Nazi propaganda. But they were so nice and pleasant compared to normal POW camps that they became known as holiday camps. It worked. The Nazis did recruit British prisoners to the SS. The rumours are that when Churchill first heard about the British SS, he flew into a rage. Churchill saw that it was a propaganda coup and it was a blight upon the good name of the British people. It goes against every image we have of the Second World War. The British are the good guys. They're not the SS Nazi torturers. Or so we like to think. So does this SS recruitment drive explain the list of British names found at Auschwitz? One theory is that this list of names is those people who had quietly made their interest known to the German authorities. If so, it is a source of enormous shame to the British. The war against National Socialism was indeed a battle of good against evil. But nations did not neatly and simply divide into one camp or the other. The truth is, of course, that there were a great many Germans who loathed the Nazis. And another surprising truth is that there were countless people in Britain and America and elsewhere who secretly admired them. In the United States, there had been a long, dark tradition of racism. In the South, in the 1920s, the Ku Klux Klan had millions of supporters, including a young Harry S. Truman, who was later to become American president. Many members of the KKK were attracted to fascism. In 1939, they and other American Nazi sympathizers were on parade. In Madison Square Garden in New York, American fascists held a rally. And you had 20,000 people waving swastikas and making Nazi salutes and, and chanting Heil Hitler. But the rally was a one-off. In America, as in Britain, Nazi sympathizers were overwhelmed by the vast majority of the population, who found National Socialism repugnant. But despite being in the minority, some went to extreme lengths to pledge their allegiance to the fascist cause. Another British aristocrat, who was a well-known sympathizer of Nazism, was Unity Mitford. Mitford was studying in Munich and is said to have stalked the Fuhrer until he finally invited her to join him at his restaurant table. 
he is said to have become smitten with the young British aristocrat. She tried to persuade the Fuhrer that Britain was a natural ally and supplied him with a list of British people who shared his views. And she even appeared in public with Hitler when he announced the annexation of Austria. Her relationship with Hitler is rumored to have gone so far that she became pregnant by him. But after Britain's declaration of war in September 1939, she was so distraught she attempted suicide. Hitler arranged for her to return to Britain, but she never fully recovered. Fascism was never going to catch on in Britain, and particularly America, both countries which attached an immense amount of importance to their individual liberties. Happily, Hitler's attempt to create a British SS unit was a humiliating failure. Thankfully, the British SS unit was a mighty flop. It never exceeded 60 men, 60 traitors. The caliber of men who signed up was lamentably poor. Wretched petty criminals, mindless thugs, men of extremely low intelligence, and a small number of sad, underachieving, upper-class anti-Semites. They were not the creme de la creme of the British fighting force, and as such, they made an ineffective fighting unit. This was not the master race Hitler was after, nor indeed was it pure Aryan. John Amory, the founder of the British SS, never admitted it, but his grandmother was Jewish. In the last weeks of the war, Amory was captured in northern Italy by resistance fighters. He was sent back to Britain, where he was convicted for treason. His trial lasted just eight minutes. On the 19th of December, 1945, he was hanged. Coming up on World War Weird, Stalin's bizarre army of exploding dogs, Rommel's hidden hoard of Nazi gold, strange shapes etched onto the Earth's surface, a dark Nazi plot, or a wartime visit from UFOs and a weird wartime board game that defies explanation. Conflict on a scale never seen before or since. A new kind of war. This is war at its weirdest. Bizarre experimental weapons. Mysterious events. Conspiracies and cover-ups. When governments destroy files, you can't help but wonder why. Unexplained phenomena. The RAF doesn't have an explanation for the crew's report. When a world goes to war with itself, things get weird. This Nazi war machine is hurtling towards Russia. But Stalin's battered Red Army has come up with a cunning new weapon to stop it in its tracks. The Soviets think they found a way to defeat the might of Nazi Germany. He wanted to unleash kamikaze canines. This is the weird story of Stalin's crazy communist canine army. It sounds barking, but there was method in their madness. Cutting edge of modern day military technology, the unmanned drone. A delivery system that takes devastation to the enemy accurately without risking the lives of troops. But in the age before computers and lasers, what was the crude communist equivalent? This is the weird story of Stalin's crazy canine corps the Red Dog Army. In 1939, Nazi Germany storms continental Europe with a devastating new strategy. Blitzkrieg. A lethal combination of air power, tanks, and infantry. Blitzkrieg means lightning war in German, and that's exactly what it was. 
By the summer of 1941, with only Britain left fighting in Europe, Hitler turns his war machine to a new target, the Soviet Union. Stalin didn't believe that Hitler would attack him when he was still busy battling the British in the West. But he was seriously mistaken. On June the 22nd, Germany launches the largest offensive in the history of warfare. Operation Barbarossa. Invading Russia with an army of three million men, 2,700 aircraft, 7,200 field guns, and more than 3,000 tanks. The Soviet Union is caught completely unprepared. To make matters worse, the country is still reeling from Stalin's brutal purges. The populations of its outer reaches are hateful and rebellious. And its best generals, victims of Stalin's vicious dictatorship. Stalin's secret police, the NKVD, had arrested, tortured and executed the majority of Russia's military high command. This included 500 senior officers and eight generals. Those who are left are simply no match for the German commanders. The colossal scale of Operation Barbarossa is devastating. On the first day of the invasion, a quarter of the Soviet Air Force is destroyed by the Luftwaffe. Within the first three weeks, Germany's Panzer Tank Division has almost totally wiped out the Russian Army's mechanized corps. Within four months, three million Russian soldiers have been captured and almost half Russia's population is under German rule. The German Panzer Corps were unstoppable. They had better tanks, better crews, better everything. Soviet production is notoriously sloppy. There are too few vehicles and arms. They often don't work properly and break down too easily. The main Russian battle tank is the T-34, a great tank when it works. It's only good for about 200 kilometers before it breaks down. In their rush to war, the Soviets have sacrificed quality for quantity. The Soviet Union is on its knees. For every German tank lost, the Soviets are losing seven of theirs. The Soviets needed to figure out a way to stop them, and they needed to do it fast. Stalin needs a miracle, and he thinks he's found one. It is in a state of total desperation that Stalin authorizes one of the weirdest ideas of World War II, an army of dogs. It sounds barking, but there was method in their madness. The Soviets had already had some success in getting dogs to deliver food and medical supplies to the front line. Why not go the next step and turn this four-legged force into canine combat troops? The dogs would be trained to attack panzer tanks. The idea was to have a bomb strapped to the back of the dog. The dog would then be trained to run to the Nazi tank. It would pull a cord, releasing the bomb, and run back to its handler. They're smart, fast, and trainable, and the perfect delivery system. What could possibly go wrong? Three special military dog schools are set up. Their job? To train thousands of combat dogs. And to fill the ranks of Stalin's new army, his agents scour Russia, conscripting dogs from farms, police forces, even circuses. The dogs are trained to run under the tanks, drop the bomb, and run off. But it doesn't work so well. Some dogs fail to head for the tanks. Others forget to pull the cord and return to their alarmed handlers for a pat on the head. The handlers try to run from the dogs, but the dogs are too fast. They're carrying an explosive charge with a timer fuse on it. So when the dog runs back to his owner, boom. A dog bomb doesn't exactly work if the very same dog comes running back to you and blows you up like some kind of bomb boomerang. For the Soviets, it's back to the drawing board. 
Undeterred, the Russians try again. This time, the combat dogs are starved for a few days. Then warm food is placed beneath stationary tanks. Before long, the dogs associate tanks with dinner. Then a new dog bomb is devised that will trigger automatically when the dog runs beneath the tank. The plan is to load each dog with a mine containing 10 to 12 kilograms of TNT. A wooden lever sticks up from the pack. The dog sees the tank, thinks it's dinner time, and dives underneath. The lever hits the underside of the tank and is forced down, triggering a detonator that explodes. The new bomb will kill the dog, but hopefully not the dog handlers. War is a time when anything goes, even kamikaze canines. The 1st Battalion of Combat Canines arrives at the front line in autumn 1941. 30 dogs and 40 handlers. The hungry dogs are fitted with bombs, and when the line of panzer tanks advances towards the Russians, the dogs are released. But because of fuel shortages, many of the dogs have had no training with moving tanks. The sight and sound of so many advancing panzers causes panic among the dogs. Some of them head for cover in the Soviet trenches. In many cases, they turned, they ran, or were picked off by German snipers. Sometimes they ran back to their own lines and actually killed Soviet soldiers. Some of the dogs have been trained with Russian diesel tanks. Inconveniently, the German panzers run on petrol, a very different smell to the dogs. A number of hungry suicide hounds laden with explosives head off to find food under their own tanks. In reality, a war zone or battlefield is a terrifying place for a dog. Shells exploding, bullets whistling past, aircraft overhead, the cries of the wounded, unusual smells, and add to that that the dog's never even seen a moving tank before. It's really different from its training environment. Russia is not the only country intent on turning animals into deadly weapons. Over on the Western Front, the British are faced with the challenge of taking out an elusive target of their own. The Nazi war machine now has factories across the whole of occupied Europe, pumping out a relentless supply of deadly arms and ammunition. Bombing raids against these enemy targets are a hit and miss affair. On the ground, many brave covert resistance operatives are more than willing to sabotage these weapon production lines from within, but it's easier said than done to bomb a factory without blowing your cover. Obviously, it was not easy for the Allies to smuggle in bombs. Bombs were big, they were cumbersome, they were hard to hide, so they had to think laterally. They had to find something unremarkable, something almost invisible, which could serve as a carrier for the bombs. What could be found in abundance in factories that wouldn't raise eyebrows? Coal-fired boilers and furnaces are the power source at the heart of most wartime factories. Without them, production would grind to a halt. They are highly prized and heavily guarded. All you would expect to find near them is a big pile of coal and the occasional dead rat. Boffins in the British Intelligence Service have a cunning plan. There would have been thousands of rats in thousands of factories right the way across occupied Europe. So just imagine if one in ten of those rats was actually full of plastic explosives. Boffins hoped that if they filled rats with explosives and smuggled them into factory coal piles, workers would simply throw them into the boiler along with the coal, bringing manufacturing to a screeching halt. The beauty of the dead rat, it was a common sight in factories and it had its own built-in trigger. With a giant explosion, the diligent factory worker has just blown up his own factory. A British intelligence officer poses as a student to get hold of hundreds of rats supposedly for use in experiments. The animals are killed and then stuffed with explosives. Once thrown into a boiler's furnace, the detonator ignites, triggering an explosion with the potential to take out the whole factory. 
It's so simple, it's genius. All they have to do now is get the rat bombs over into Europe and distributed amongst the resistance movements. All is going to plan until the Germans intercept the very first shipment of rat bombs. Game's over before it's even really started. But that's not the full story. The Germans knew these rat bombs must be intended for sabotage, but sabotage of what or where was a mystery. You have to ask yourself what the Germans thought this was all about. What targets were they aimed at? Where were they going? German intelligence was baffled. The Germans mount a huge operation to find any bombs that might have already found their way into sensitive locations. But they have no idea how long this ruse has been in operation. The Germans wasted hundreds of man hours searching for these rat bombs that didn't in fact exist. And that in the end was more damaging than if the plan had succeeded in the first place. Rat bombs did succeed in disrupting enemy production, although not in the way originally intended. The boffins at British intelligence went on to create many more devilish devices, including exploding soap, suitcases, and bottles of booze. All this went on to inspire the character Q, the gadget man in the James Bond movies. Back on the Eastern Front, Stalin's bomb dogs had yet to prove their worth on the battlefield. Out of 30 dogs, only four set off their bombs anywhere near a German tank. Despite this disaster, the Soviets persist with their erratic and accident-prone dog army. Its greatest success comes during the biggest tank battle in history. At the Battle of Kursk in 1943, 16 dogs disabled 12 German tanks. Now, that may sound like a success, but that does not warrant the amount of time, the amount of effort, and the amount of money that this project had put into it. It is not known how many of their own tanks and other Russian vehicles the Soviet bomb dogs destroyed, or how many handlers were blown up. The whole plan of turning dogs into mobile anti-tank mines is an unmitigated disaster. And a propaganda boost for the invading Germans. They think Stalin's dog soldiers are hilarious. They joke that Stalin needs dogs to fight because ordinary Russians refuse to. But the Germans aren't laughing for long. Something far, far deadlier than bomb dogs is heading towards them at speed. The Russian winter. A vast hoard of treasure stolen and then hidden by the Nazis. Gold, silver, jewelry, religious artifacts. A nest egg for Nazi leaders when the war is over. The plan is to retrieve the hall when things quieten down in the region. The question is, where did the Nazis hide it? Finding Nazi gold, it's the holy grail of World War II mysteries. Nineteen forty eight. Three years after the end of the war, and a German man using a false name, Peter Fleig, leads a team of divers exploring the Bay of Bastia off the northeastern coast of the island of Corsica. But this is no pleasure jaunt. The man is a former member of the SS, and according to reports in Corsica, there is a hoard of Nazi gold hidden somewhere among the rocks and caves. Fly claims he was involved in an extraordinary mission to hide Nazi gold off the coast of Corsica at the end of World War II. Fleig fails to find the gold, but another search follows. This time led by a former senior British naval pilot, Lieutenant Commander John Godley, the third Lord Kilbracken. A lot of people are going to a lot of effort. It looks like there might be something to these rumors. The searches fail to locate the gold, but the rumors persist. A vast store of stolen loot hidden beneath the waves off the coast of Corsica. But where did it come from? And how did it get there? 
As soon as they gain power, the Nazis demonstrate a lust for other people's money. Under National Socialism, the state is all-powerful, and the people who run the state, Nazi party members, use this power to get rich. For anything to get done, in business or in daily life, one or more officials have to be bribed, or else they simply help themselves by force. Hitler himself accumulates vast riches, as do other senior Nazis. Hermann Goering oversees the systematic plundering of occupied Europe. The private property of Jewish people in particular is taken without hesitation or compunction. The limitless greed of the Nazis sinks to complete depravity as they use pliers to remove gold teeth from Jewish people after gassing them to death. And in 1941, a new opportunity arises for the Nazis to pillage on a vast scale when Rommel invades North Africa to rescue the Italian army. Rommel was a Nazi super soldier. He was a great strategist and even better tactician. He was well respected by both the Axis and the Allies. Rommel sweeps through Northern Africa, pushing back the Allies in Tunisia and the deserts of Libya and Egypt. His initial success in North Africa earns him the nickname, the Desert Fox. And behind Rommel's front line, in charge of subduing the population, are the SS. Led by the mass-murdering, rabid anti-Semite SS colonel, Walter Ralph. When you think of evil, sinister Nazis from the movies, Ralph is like that, but worse. At the time, there are Jewish communities who have lived for centuries in Morocco, Algeria, and other North African countries. As the Nazis advance through these territories, Ralph confiscates their property and rounds them up. He designs a mobile gas chamber. Now, this is a van in which the exhaust from the vehicle is piped back inside the lorry. And it can hold up to 60 people at one time. And as it drives along, it simply gasses the occupants to death. Thousands of Jews die during the Axis occupation of Tunisia. And Ralph sends thousands more to forced labor camps. As Ralph's murderous caravan proceeds, he accumulates a vast hoard of treasure. The teams were looting the families of anything valuable. Gold, silver, jewelry, religious artifacts. In one small community alone, they took 43 kilos of valuables. They quickly amassed a fortune. But the Nazi looting stops when Rommel's desert campaign runs into trouble. Despite his genius as a commander, Rommel is outclassed by Britain's Field Marshal Montgomery, who takes command of Britain's Desert Rats in 1942. Rommel thinks he's got the British trapped, but he's in for a nasty surprise, because Montgomery manages to rally his Desert Rats and smashes the Africa Corps. Montgomery predicts Rommel's every move. He is helped by British intelligence and also the fact that Rommel has foolishly written a book describing his approach to military tactics, which his enemies have almost certainly read. Now it's the Germans who are on the back foot. Rommel is forced to retreat into Tunisia, hounded all the way by Montgomery's desert rats. At the Second Battle of El Alamein, Montgomery pulverizes Rommel's panzer divisions with heavy artillery. The Desert Fox is forced to flee North Africa, along with what remains of the Africa Corps and the Nazi monster Walter Ralph. But here the mystery starts of what happened to the Nazis' vast hoard of looted treasure. According to one theory, it is carried off by U-boat. The story goes 
that Rommel instructs a U-boat crew to wait for nightfall, then seal the gold and other treasures in watertight ammunition boxes. Fearful of the war turning against them, the treasure is to be taken to the east coast of Corsica to be hidden in undersea caves. Insurance against an Allied victory. The plan is to retrieve the hall when things quieten down in the region. But as the U-boat sails, it's spotted by an American B-17 flying fortress. According to this version of events, the gold-laden U-boat is sunk somewhere in the Mediterranean. But a different story emerges after the war, following the confession of a member of the SS, Walter Kierner. Kierner was incarcerated in the former Nazi concentration camp at Dachau, which was used by the Americans as a special prison for former SS officers and war criminals. Nazi officers are now imprisoned in their own camps, but under infinitely better conditions. Now, Allied intelligence agencies set to work. Kerner is interrogated by the French Secret Service, the CIA and MI6. Kierner is said to have informed the Allied intelligence officers that fellow inmates of Dachau had told him the story of how six steel boxes of treasure had been hidden. Kierner says it was Ralph, not Rommel, who ordered the treasure to be buried in Corsica until it was safe to return it to Germany. However, since an Allied invasion of Corsica became more and more likely, Ralph ordered the treasure to be hidden offshore. At the end of the war, the Nazi butcher Walter Ralph escapes to Chile. He cannot leave for fear of being arrested for his crimes. But shortly after the war, a team of divers led by the former SS soldier Peter Fleig mount the first of several attempts to find the Nazi gold. In another rumored attempt, a diver is found dead, killed, it seems, by his own harpoon. The local talk is that the Mafia are behind it. It appears someone does not want the gold to be found. Rumour has it that the Mafia didn't like outsiders looking for their gold. The death of the diver is thought to have been a warning. And the truth behind the mysterious Nazi gold remains as elusive as ever. Until a British writer makes what could be a major breakthrough. The story comes back to life when a British investigator, Terry Hodgkinson, unearths a photograph of a 20-year-old Walter Kierner with his parents. It is now thought that Kierner is one and the same person as Peter Flying, the former SS man who leads the first dive team. And on the back of this photograph, Hodgkinson notices writing. Scrawled on the back of the photo in fading blue ink is what looks like a code. We already know that Kerner mixed with men who may have known the treasure's location. The hope is that the code contains grid references or coordinates as to the exact location of the treasure. But the code remains uncracked and the treasure remains hidden. There is no doubt that the Nazis in North Africa expropriated vast quantities of wealth from their innocent victims. What happened to it remains a mystery. Suspicious rings etched onto the earth, spotted by British pilots. MI5 took a huge interest in what we would now call crop circles. Who or what has created them? Everyone's a suspect. Could these be marker signals for Luftwaffe bombers? What would have been their main targets? Munitions factories and airfields. Or are the crop circles communications of a different kind? Recently declassified documents reveal an official investigation during World War II 
into the appearance of crop circles. Crop circles are mysterious patterns found in farmers' fields. Some people think they're evidence of UFO landings. Most people nowadays think they're just man-made hoaxes. But back in World War II, no one was hoaxing anyone. No one had ever heard of aliens. And the term UFO hadn't been coined. And yet here they were. Giant circles carved into fields of crops, captured from above by RAF spotter planes. All these reports were seriously investigated by MI5. Nowadays, we would probably call them UFO reports. But in 1940, British intelligence agencies are not worried about visitors from another planet. They know that Germans are preparing to invade Britain. Any invasion will involve surgical airstrikes on key targets. That means bomber crews will need recognizable landmarks to help them navigate. When the Luftwaffe bombed Poland, there were Nazi spies on the ground to guide the planes to their targets. The result was devastating. So what kind of signals could a potential spy on the ground give to a Luftwaffe bomber? Well, at night they could light fires, use torches, and at day they could lay out linen or fabric on the ground. Or they could make marks in fields, like crop circles. Britain is well aware of the methods being used by Nazi agents and saboteurs at work in Europe. They're part of an interconnected web of spies who've been trained to help the German war machine. They have a name. They're called the Fifth Column. The term Fifth Column dates back to the Spanish Civil War. A general would attack a town with four columns of soldiers, and he'd have a fifth column hiding inside the town. The Fifth Column was made up of secret agents and sympathizers acting as saboteurs. And in 1940, the existence of the fifth column operating in Britain was one of Winston Churchill's major concerns. Munitions factories are the pulsating heart of the British war effort. If the fifth column gets to Britain and successfully guides Luftwaffe planes to these factories, Churchill might as well wave a big white flag, because no planes means no defence. Within months of the outbreak of war, the government launches a campaign to warn the British public. Everyone must be vigilant against fifth columnists, spies and saboteurs within our ranks, out to help the Germans. The British press have reached fever pitch. Where is the fifth column? Have the web of spies reached Britain? Then disturbing reports start coming in from RAF pilots. Strange markings had been noticed in various fields. A pilot flying above South Wales reports seeing a gigantic marking near Glasgow. The pattern showed what looked to be the letter G in a field of crops. Intelligence agents are sent in to investigate. MI5 found that the tail of the G pointed directly to a munitions factory. The G could easily be a marker for enemy pilots. MI5 admit the fifth column could be active in Britain. A second symbol is spotted near an RAF radio station in Kent. RAF aerial reconnaissance find a clear white circle with the word Marden spelt out in the middle of it. Who or what made this crop circle? Then aluminium discs are found laid out in a rough circle on the ground near an aircraft factory in Southampton. As well as the large signs, MI5 also receive reports of weirdly shaped graffiti found in different parts of the country. Some of these symbols look like Nazi swastikas. Others feature the outline of the east coast of England. There were marks on telegraph poles. There were maps and charts being found under stones and being washed up on the Thames. They all seem to point towards some fifth column activity. MI5 is officially on red alert. 
British intelligence launches a manhunt. But fifth columnists are hand-picked for their ability to blend in with the general population. People were paranoid. Everyone's a suspect. The government even brought in new laws to detain anyone without trial for threatening the safety of the realm. In an attempt to catch the spies before they do any damage, British intelligence decides to deploy their ultimate weapon. Eric Roberts. Eric Roberts was just 17, working as a junior bank clerk when he was recruited to MI5 by the spymaster Maxwell Knight, on whom the James Bond character M was based. What made Roberts so special was that he was so normal. Nobody would suspect him. When the war starts, Roberts is instructed by MI5 to befriend those sympathetic to Oswald Mosley's black shirts. Eric Roberts masqueraded as a supposed Gestapo agent called Jack King, and he was steadily fed information from Nazi sympathisers in Britain throughout the war. These closet Nazis think Roberts is sending their information back to Berlin, but in fact, he is passing it to M, the MI5 spymaster Maxwell Knight. But none of this information uncovers anything about the mysterious markings found up and down Britain. What's more, declassified files reveal that some of these symbols are not as sinister as first thought. The strange symbols on walls and gateposts are in fact believed to be secret messages left by tramps and travellers for others who follow in their footsteps. During the Great Depression, tramps and hobos would travel America looking for food, work, and shelter. To help each other, they left coded messages on telegraph poles indicating where to go and where to avoid. These so-called hobo codes caught on among British tramps in the late 1930s. MI5 investigations also revealed that the G-shaped crop circle in Glasgow has a perfectly innocent explanation. This was not the work of a fifth column. This was simply a farmer who had some surplus barley and sowed it in a field, creating a random pattern. As for the Marden crop circle in Kent, MI5 discovered that it is, in fact, a relic of the site's history as an airfield. It had a circle of stones around the word Marden to identify it to pilots. When they decommissioned the airfield in 1935, the crops grew up around these stones to leave a natural crop mark, which spelled out the name. A lot of these crop circles were investigated, and it was found that there were perfectly innocent explanations. So crop circles were not the work of fifth columnists in Britain. MI5 believe Hitler's attempt to create a fifth column in Britain was an unmitigated disaster. Ultimately, it was the RAF that kept the Luftwaffe at bay. Hitler's grand plan to invade Britain came to nothing, thanks in large part to the brave pilots who flew in the Battle of Britain. A sinister advert appears in a New York magazine. Bombs are dropping, yet people are laughing. Then within days comes the Pearl Harbor attack. After Pearl Harbor, these adverts took on a more sinister hue. Was the advert a coded warning? They didn't see what was happening right under their very noses. The FBI has no choice. It has to investigate. On November the 22nd, 1941, the New Yorker runs a strange advertisement. This advert says the words Achtung, warning, alert, and it has a couple of dice on it with unusual numbers. It urges readers to turn to page 86. Here, there is a second advertisement for a dice game called the Deadly Double. At the bottom is a double-headed eagle that looks ominously Germanic. The United States is not yet at war. However, German U-boats are thinking U.S. ships. The advertisement, it's really bad taste. It's an advertisement for a family board game. And yet the body of the ad depicts an air raid blitz and a group of people in an underground bunker playing the deadly double. 
This image is weird. It shows an air raid shelter with bombs dropping, and yet people are laughing. Laughing is the last thing you'd be doing. The advert goes unnoticed by the authorities. Then, 16 days later, America suffers the worst military surprise attack in its history. December the 7th, 1941. Hundreds of Japanese fighter, bomber, and torpedo planes hit the American Pacific Fleet stationed at Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. There is no warning, no declaration of war. Within two hours, the Japanese destroy 19 American warships and kill two and a half thousand servicemen and women. Pearl Harbor wrecks everything. It completely messes with the American psyche. Until now, America has stayed out of World War II, but now the American public wants revenge. I ask that the Congress declare a state of war between the United States and the Japanese Empire. The bombing of Pearl Harbor is brilliantly executed. The Japanese know exactly when and where to attack. It looks like they had inside information. Attention turns to the strange, deadly double advertisement. When they were published, no one thought anything of these adverts, but after Pearl Harbor, they took on a more sinister hue. So many details in the ad raise suspicion. The date, the Germanic symbols, the air raid shelter. Some people thought that it was simply too much of a coincidence. Were the deadly double ads warning Japanese agents in the US of an impending attack? Radio communications are susceptible to interception. In 1941, undercover agents in foreign countries have to be alerted and activated by other means. The story goes that readers of the New Yorker bombarded FBI phone lines with anxious calls about the deadly double ads. Why would anyone invent a game to be played underground in a blitz? Some people believe that this warned enemy agents to take cover from the upcoming raid. The suspicious ad creates sudden fear of agents and double agents in America. The location of the air shelter in the ad isn't clear. This shelter could be in Hawaii. FBI cryptoanalysts get to work on the contents of the adverts. The first ad shows two dice with the numbers 12 and 7, 24, 5 and 0. One face also bears the Roman numeral for 20, double X. The numbers ring alarm bells in the FBI. They deduce that the 7 and the 12 on the two dies could be a cryptic reference to the date of the attack. 7, 12, the 7th of December. The figures 5 and 0 could have represented the planned time for the attack, and the Roman numeral for 20 could represent the latitude for Pearl Harbor. Even the name, the deadly double, could be alluding to the Axis powers, Germany and Japan. The FBI moved to find out who placed the ad. What's curious is the FBI speaks to the New Yorker magazine. They find out that they don't know who this guy is. They give a description of him, but he was completely anonymous. The FBI agents are looking for clues in New York, but they should be looking in Hawaii. Since the US was not at war with Japan prior to the attack, personnel connected with the Japanese consulate were free to enjoy the sights and pleasures of the islands. One of them was Takio Yashikawa, a graduate of the Imperial Japanese Naval Academy, who, instead of becoming a naval pilot, joins the Japanese naval intelligence. In Hawaii, Yoshikawa poses as an embassy official. He grows his hair longer to look more like a civilian. And this means that he can mingle with the Japanese population who are living in Hawaii at that time. 
Takio Yoshikawa attracts little attention. At night, he behaves like other Japanese young men in Hawaii. He visits tea houses and Japanese clubs, enjoying the company of geisha girls. By day, Yoshikawa behaves like a tourist. He travels the islands buying postcards and tourist trinkets. No one suspects this young Japanese man with a camera around his neck. Yoshikawa travels to a key military location in Hawaii, charting the movements of US warships. He hires small aeroplanes to fly close to military installations for aerial shots. And he charters glass-bottomed pleasure cruise boats to survey Anchorage and other details of Pearl Harbor. Yoshikawa sends his detailed notes of US military movements to the consulate in Honolulu, which then informs Tokyo via coded telegraph messages. But Yoshikawa is not the only Axis agent working in Hawaii. German spy Bernard Julius Otto Kuhn had been sent to Hawaii in 1935 by Joseph Goebbels. He posed with his wife as wealthy socialites hosting lavish parties to which they invited senior American military personnel. He owns two homes, he has plenty of cash, but oddly, he has no job. Kuhn transmits information to his Japanese counterparts via an elaborate signaling method, which involves leaving various lights on at night and hanging different objects out to dry at different times. Kuhn is like a spy straight out of a Hollywood movie of the time. He, he looks shifty, he's got lots of money, and he's got his secret messaging system. Instructions for the Axis agents come from Japan. On September 24, 1941, just over two months before the Pearl Harbor attack, officials in Tokyo send a secret message to its consulate in Hawaii. The Japanese military request information about the positions of various US ships around Hawaii, and this message is now known as the bomb plot. Incredibly, the coded message is intercepted and deciphered by American agents 15 days after it is sent, but US spy agencies fail to spot the danger. Frankly, they took their eye off the ball. They were so wrapped up in other things, they didn't see what was happening right under their very noses. On the same day Pearl Harbor is attacked, American police raid the Japanese consulate in Hawaii. In front of their eyes, they see consulate officials openly burning documentation. The consulate staff are all arrested that same morning. Yoshikawa is later interrogated in Phoenix, but he denies being a spy claiming that he was merely taking tourist excursions around the Hawaiian Islands. The story is clearly nonsense, and yet Yoshikawa escapes execution. He is repatriated to Japan in a diplomatic prisoner exchange in August 1942. But his German counterpart, Kuhn, does not escape justice so easily. The day after the attack, the FBI finds a report of US fleet movements at the Japanese consulate, which Kuhn has supplied he is immediately arrested. He is found guilty of spying and sentenced to be shot by musketry in Honolulu. This is downgraded to 50 years of hard labor and he is later deported. Could Kuhn and Yoshikawa be the deadly double in the cryptic advertisement? FBI investigators track down the man who placed the mysterious deadly double adverts. The man is named Roger Craig, and he is the inventor of the game. There is no evidence of Craig being involved with foreign intelligence agencies. The FBI is forced to conclude that the ad was a weird coincidence. In the end, the FBI are forced to drop the case due to a lack of firm evidence. The deadly double game may well have been a coincidence, but frankly, had the Americans been paying more attention to what was going on in Hawaii, then they might have averted the most devastating attack on Pearl Harbor. Coming up on World War Weird. Monsters from the lab, half ape, half human, following orders from one of the biggest mass murderers in history. Zombie spies, the dead man who double-crossed Hitler. Killer bugs from the Nazi death camps. A mystery plague that hits America. And the ghost ship in the clouds. 
the rogue Zeppelin and its incredible vanishing crew. Conflict on a scale never seen before or since. A new kind of war. This is war at its weirdest. Bizarre experimental weapons. Mysterious events. Conspiracies and cover-ups. When governments destroy files, you can't help but wonder why. Unexplained phenomena. The RAF doesn't have an explanation for the crew's report. When a world goes to war with itself, things get weird. An army of intelligent killer ape men fighting the Nazis. Hitler's forces savaged by genetically modified beasts. This was World War II's Planet of the Apes. Not the stuff of science fiction, but real-life Frankenstein science. Imagine an army of monsters created in a lab. An army of ferocious ape men taking orders from the evil Joseph Stalin. It has been said that they wanted to create an army of giant apes. This would be a new breed of super warrior, half ape, half man. Stalin wanted to create giant apes with superhuman strength. Intelligent, agile, and fearless. Stalin had some crazy ideas, and for the scientists of communist Russia, this is not just the stuff of science fiction. They are also experimenting with animal warriors. When the Germans invade Russia in June 1941, they encounter a fighting force they hadn't expected. As the German tanks roared across the plains of Western Russia, suddenly dogs ran at them. These dogs had been fitted with bombs and had been trained to run underneath the tanks and blow them up. Whole regiments of bomb dogs are trained in three special schools created by Stalin. The dogs simply weren't reliable. Their main use was against tanks, and they didn't even do that very well. But what if a whole army of much more efficient battlefield beasts could be created? But why does Stalin need and want an army of killer intelligent ape men? He is trying to solve a problem the Soviets themselves have created. In the years after the revolution, the communists rule by terror. The secret political police, the Cheka, torture and murder ordinary Russians in their tens of thousands. In this supposed workers' paradise, no one was free to change jobs, criticize the regime, or even travel. Peasants had their plots taken from them and were forced onto collective farms, and anybody who went on strike, they were simply shot. The secret police later become the NKVD, and they take the Red Terror to new levels of barbarism. Millions of Russians are sent to the hellish Gulag prison camps, or else simply murdered. An offhand comment or an ill-considered joke is enough to have you and your family arrested, tortured, and killed. This Red Terror creates a population which is passive and fearful, but it turns them against their communist masters. In 1941, Germany invades, and the advancing troops are welcomed as liberators by many impoverished and oppressed Soviet citizens. To make matters worse, Stalin's purges have decimated his own army. In 1937, Stalin's secret police, the NKVD, arrested, tortured, and executed the majority of the Russian military high command. That included some 500 senior officers and eight generals. To replace officers killed in the purges, junior soldiers are promoted. Red Army conscripts are nervous, dispirited, and resentful. 
they hate the Germans less than they hate their own communist commissars. As the Germans storm across Russia's eastern territories, the Soviet forces simply crumble and millions of their soldiers surrender. With too few tanks, too few guns, and far too few good soldiers, Stalin really needed an army of superhuman ape men on his side. Ever since the 1917 revolution, Soviet leaders have talked of creating a new breed of superhumans who are perfectly obedient to communist rule. Stalin is reported to say, I want a new invincible human being insensitive to pain, resistant and indifferent about the quality of food they eat. These Soviet supermen would be super strong, super intelligent, able to suppress their feelings and programmed to sacrifice themselves in the interests of the socialist state. The socialist superhumans will not be created in a lab, but will be the products of a superior communist system. The perfect society will create perfect people. But so far, the perfect communist system has delivered only famine, poverty, and fear. So Stalin will have to create a different kind of super strong warrior, a creature only partly human. Since the Middle Ages, there have been stories of women who had bred with apes and given birth to monstrous creatures. Some Soviet scientists began to wonder could such creatures be created in a lab and, and bred like dogs and horses for strength and speed and loyalty? Work starts on a human-ape hybrid after the end of World War I. Heading the program is Professor Ilya Ivanovich Ivanov, a leading expert in the artificial insemination of farm animals. He has already successfully bred a zebra with a donkey to make a z-donk. Crossed a cow with a bison to get a zubron. And a zebra with a horse to create a zorse. His new challenge is to create a cross between a human and an ape. Ivanov was convinced that apes and humans were very close biological cousins, and actually he was dead right. Humans have one pair fewer chromosomes than other great apes. Having a different number of chromosomes is not an absolute barrier to breeding with other species. Ivanov and his colleagues begin a program of artificial insemination. This will involve crossbreeding female apes with a number of selected Russian men. To begin with, Ivanov attempts to make female apes pregnant using sperm thought to have been donated by his 22-year-old son. In effect, he is creating his own half-human grandchild. But despite repeated attempts, the female apes fail to become pregnant. This is the point where the research took an even darker turn. Ivanov decided to use women in his experiments. He selected a number of women to be inseminated with the sperm of male orangutans. The ethics of making women give birth to ape monsters did not stop Ivanov and his fellow scientists. Ivanov lines up five women to conduct his first trials. To inseminate them, a suitably strong, agile, intelligent orangutan is selected and transported hundreds of miles to the lab. The 26-year-old ape is called Tarzan. But just before Tarzan is able to inseminate the women, he suffers a brain hemorrhage and dies. Ivanov's ambitious dream dies with Tarzan. He has failed to prove that ape and human DNA are compatible and the regime loses patience with his research. At the point when Ivanov is trying to create this half-ape, half-human hybrid, the science of genetics is only just beginning. Within decades, scientific advances lead to successful in vitro fertilization, cloning, and genetic modification. If 
Ivanov knew then what we know now, Stalin might have got his monster army of human hybrids. If he'd had the kind of technology that created Dolly the Sheep, he might have got closer to his goal. But thankfully, the tools of modern genetic science were not available to Stalin. In the end, the only monstrous animals in the Red Army are the Communist Party commissars and secret police, who torture and murder countless millions of people. Operation Zombie, the dead man sent to defeat Hitler. The young Spanish fisherman realizes that he's looking at a decomposing dead body. He's the man that never was. A mystery corpse found floating off the Spanish coast with a dodgy dossier of fake invasion plans. The Nazis can't believe their luck. Finding detailed military plans of your enemy was the equivalent of winning the lottery. But this dead man is not who he seems. This is the story of one of the greatest cons in history that may well have won World War II. In September 1942, an Allied seaplane crashes off the Spanish coast near Cadiz killing all passengers. Among the dead, British Navy courier Lieutenant James Haddon Turner. Turner is carrying a top secret document about Operation Torch, the planned Allied invasion of French North Africa. When Turner's body washes up on the coast, this document ends up in the hands of the Spanish. The prospect of top secret documents getting into the hands of German operatives is pretty much a worst case scenario. When the body is returned to the British, the document is still there, in the jacket pocket. The British are convinced that it's not been read, but there are no guarantees. It's a narrow escape for the Allies, but it gives British secret agents an idea. They call it Operation Mincemeat. A plan is hatched by MI5's 20 Committee, an intelligence agency named after its initials XX, also known as the Double Cross Unit. Intelligence Officer Flight Lieutenant Charles Chumley has the idea of planting a corpse carrying a radio behind enemy lines. When it falls into German hands, the radio will be used to feed false information to Nazi high command. The idea is considered unworkable, and so Chumley's team in MI5, including James Bond author Ian Fleming, rework it to include personal effects, documents and fake ID that would fool the Germans. The idea sounds crazy. An MI5 zombie agent carrying misinformation to the Nazi high command. So crazy, it might just work. So MI5 take their plan to Churchill. Churchill loves spying, double agents and subterfuge. And he said that the agents who proposed this plan had to have corkscrew minds. Every detail had to be entirely credible, otherwise the whole house of cards would simply come tumbling down. The Double Cross Unit's first task is to find a suitable dead body. You might think that in a war, finding a body would be no problem, but it's more difficult than you might think. Dead soldiers usually have fatal wounds that can't be hidden. Fleming and his team need a body with no ties and no visible injuries to make this work. When homeless Welshman Glyndwr Michael dies in an abandoned London warehouse having eaten rat poison, he proves to be the ideal candidate. Glyndwr Michael was the perfect hero for the operation. Nobody would miss him. Michael gets a makeover, a haircut, shave and manicure. The Double Cross unit now needs to give its body a credible false identity. The identity of a man who would be in possession of fake plans for an invasion of Greece to distract the Germans from the Allies' actual intention to invade Sicily. 
They set about it as if writing a novel. Glyndur Michael is reborn as Major William Martin of the Royal Marines. A somewhat disorganised naval officer, his pockets filled with the legend of his life. The pockets of the corpse are loaded with false information. He's carrying fake receipts and even a fake letter from Lloyds Bank demanding that he repay a loan. The Double Cross unit goes to extraordinary lengths to construct Major Martin as a credible character, right down to his tailor, his club, and even creating a fake woman who was to be his bride. On the body was found a photograph of his beloved fiance and a series of well-read love letters. It turns out that this Pam was actually the receptionist at MI5. The body is taken by submarine to the Spanish coast and released into the water, with a life raft half a mile away to suggest an accident at sea. One of the most remarkable operations of World War II has begun. Key to the whole operation is the briefcase chained to the belt of Major Bill Martin's trench coat. Inside a detailed coded document revealing fake British invasion plans of Greece. A few hours after the body is released into the water, a Spanish fisherman called Jose Antonio Rey Maria sees something floating in the sea. The young Spanish fisherman realizes that he's looking at a decomposing dead body. The fisherman brings the body ashore to the nearest coastal town, Hueva in Andalusia, exactly as the double cross unit intended. Because based in Hueva, is a Nazi spy ring. The Spanish authorities believe they have in their hands a young British officer who died at sea. Copies of the documents are passed on to German intelligence. The double cross unit have just played their double bluff. The documents detail the fake plans to invade Greece, but the real target is Sicily. Sicily has immense strategic importance. If the Allies can take Sicily and then push north through Italy, they're into the heartlands of Nazi Germany. But Sicily is heavily defended. Hitler is expecting an invasion, and any attempt to take the island will end in an Allied bloodbath. But the information in the dead man's documents changes everything. For Hitler, these documents are a godsend. It's like he can suddenly read the Prime Minister's mind. According to the documents, the Allies are merely preparing a dummy invasion of Sicily as a decoy. Radio messages intercepted and decoded by the Germans appear to confirm that Greece is the real target. Nazi intelligence begins to detect frenzied radio traffic from the Allies, indicating that there's some unexpected troop movements. German spies report that the British have begun recruiting Greek interpreters. The information in the dead man's dodgy dossier is looking more and more genuine. Hitler is now convinced that Churchill wants him to think he's preparing to attack Sicily, when the real invasion will happen in Greece. In Britain, Codebreakers are hard at work at Bletchley Park, a manor house hidden away in the English countryside. The building has been transformed into a top secret facility by Allied intelligence. Unbeknown to Hitler, mathematicians have deciphered the complex Enigma code he uses to send his top secret communications. The Germans were overconfident with their cipher traffic. They believed it was secret. What they didn't know was that at Bletchley Park, through the Ultra Project, we were listening in to their Enigma and their Lorenz machines. When Hitler got his morning update over his breakfast, so did the people at Bletchley Park. Two weeks have passed since Glyndo Michael's body was dropped in the sea off the coast of Welva with the fake invasion plans attached to him and Churchill desperately needs to know whether Hitler has been duped by the documents. The 
Codebreakers await any message from the Fuhrer, and with thousands of Allied lives at stake, the silence is deafening. On the 14th of May, 1943, an anxious Winston Churchill receives a telegram from his team at Bletchley Park. They have intercepted a message from Hitler. Mincemeat swallowed, hook, line and sinker. The Fuhrer has taken the bait. Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister, is suspicious. After all, Goebbels specializes in selling lies. But Hitler is convinced. Hitler personally orders three whole panzer divisions and 90,000 German soldiers to leave Sicily at once and head to Greece. There, they are told to prepare for a massive surprise attack by the Allies at the precise locations indicated in the corpse's documents. But Hitler has been duped by a dead Welsh tramp. Operation Mincemeat is a resounding success. On July the 10th, 1943, 150,000 Allied troops invade Sicily. The Germans are undermanned and underprepared. Hitler is looking on in abject horror. He's just sent 90,000 crack German troops from the front lines of Sicily to a field in the middle of Greece, where essentially they've got nothing to do but twiddle their thumbs. With Hitler's panzers parked in Greece, the Allies quickly take the island of Sicily. Nazi Germany is in shock. Within days, the Italians oust Mussolini. Within weeks, the Allies are in Italy, moving north. The whole course of the war has been altered. Operation Mincemeat is one of the most successful double bluffs carried out by Britain's double cross unit. If Hitler had not been duped by Operation Mincemeat, the Allies could easily have lost hundreds of thousands of men in their attack on southern Europe. But there is an added bonus for the Allies. During subsequent operations, including D-Day and Market Garden, the Nazis discovered genuine documents on dead Allied soldiers. But after the humiliation of Operation Mincemeat, they dismissed them as hoaxes. Years after the war, the MI5 agents behind Operation Mincemeat are decorated. Meanwhile, the corpse that has served them so well has been buried with full military honors as Major William Martin at a cemetery in Hueva. When the British government reveals Michael's true identity in 1998, the gravestone is amended to read, Glyndur Michael served as Major William Martin. In life, his country had abandoned him. In death, he helped to win World War II. He was the zombie soldier who duped Hitler. A small town in America is hit by a mystery plague. Children, adults, they were falling like flies. A government operation to recruit sinister scientists from the Third Reich. Nazi scientists are brought over to America to work on government research projects. Could there be a link to a secretive island research facility? This is the start of the Cold War. America is shrouded in mystery, and yet some researchers unveil what they think actually happened. Lyme, Connecticut. In 1972, this small community is suddenly hit by a mystery disease. Children in the town start developing juvenile rheumatoid arthritis. 
Others are coming down with muscle pains, partial paralysis, and extreme fatigue. The sickness spreads to two neighboring towns. 39 children and 12 adults have been struck down. It was completely out of nowhere. Children, adults, they were falling like flies. The first symptoms are fever, headaches, and fatigue. But as the disease develops, victims experience massive swelling and pains in their joints. Victims can even lose the ability to use the muscles in their faces. In the worst cases, it's fatal. It's a ghastly disease, truly horrible. Scientists from Yale University are brought in to study the mysterious illness, which becomes known as Lyme disease. They've searched for years to find the cause. Is it coming from the water? Is it transmitted from physical contact? It's a complete mystery. In 1981, there is a breakthrough. Scientist Willy Bergdorfer finds a link between the disease and a particular variety of parasitic tick found in large numbers on the Long Island coast. Bergdorfer discovers the smoking gun that the victims of the disease report having been recently bitten by ticks. Bingo! The ticks are carrying a strain of the highly infectious Borrelia bacterium. This is a bacterium known to have originated in Europe. How have these infected ticks suddenly jumped thousands of miles to Connecticut? It is now alleged that the mystery plague has its roots in events that took place thousands of miles away in Nazi Germany. In Hitler's concentration camps, cruel scientists are performing truly horrific experiments on healthy people. Victims, including pregnant women and children, are infected with deadly bacteria. Limbs and organs are needlessly removed, often without anaesthetic, and it leaves the victims permanently mutilated and disabled. The agony does not last. They are usually killed for post-mortem examination. This is being done by qualified doctors and senior scientists. Men like Dr. Josef Mengler, who once had personally 14 twins killed in just one night by injecting chloroform into their hearts to see what happened. The experiments are carried out on the orders of Heinrich Himmler. He wants scientists to develop a devastating biological weapon, a deadly plague which can be unleashed on humans and also on farm animals in order to infect the food supplies of the Allies. Himmler orders one Nazi scientist, Dr. Eric Traub, to scour the world for exotic lethal strains of viruses. This is explosive stuff. We know that Traub's boss infected people in concentration camps with malaria, typhus, even the plague. Dr. Traub is a loyal servant of Hitler. But after the Nazis are defeated, he finds that he has a new boss. As former allies begin to jostle over the spoils of war, the Soviets are seizing Hitler's top military scientists. Traub the Nazi scientist becomes Traub the communist scientist, devising deadly weapons in a microbiological research institute in the Soviet zone. British intelligence identifies Dr. Traub as a high-priority target. The Allies know that the war is over. They're beginning to position themselves for the Cold War to come. And one of their biggest fears is that the Soviets will get hold of Traub's bio-warfare secrets. In 1948, the Scientific and Technical Intelligence Branch sends its operatives behind enemy lines into Soviet-occupied Eastern Germany. The STIB's mission is simple. Get to the Third Reich's former bioweapons lab in Reims Island and kidnap Traub. He will be offered a new life and the opportunity to continue his work in America. Under an American government initiative known as Operation Paperclip, men like Dr. Traub and other Nazi scientists are brought over to America to work on government research projects. 
the recruitment of Nazi scientists meets with outrage in the United States. These are men guilty of the most disgusting crimes. They should be standing trial at Nuremberg. They should be facing the gallows. Instead, US intelligence agencies are keeping them in luxury hotels, offering them jobs, freedom, and a new life in the good old USA. The celebrated German-born physicist Albert Einstein is one of the many who expressed their disgust. But the US military gets its way. This is the start of the Cold War. The Americans know that the communists are working on new kinds of weapons. They don't want the US to be left behind. Eric Traub, Werner von Braun, and other Nazi scientists are given US citizenship and set to work. Traub's time in America is shrouded in mystery. So much of the information remains classified, and yet some researchers are beginning to unveil what they think actually happened. It's alleged that in 1949, Traub meets with US military scientists at the Army's Biological Warfare HQ in Fort Detrick, Maryland. Knowledge which the Nazis gathered in horrific experiments is now in the hands of the US military. To test this deadly stuff, they need labs that are cut off from mainland America. They choose a small, uninhabited island off the Long Island coast. The public are told that Plum Island is simply an area for scientific research of animal diseases like foot and mouth. It's not till a local newspaper starts digging into secret government papers that the truth comes out. On Plum Island, the American government was running a biological weapons program. In 1993, declassified documents show the government has been lying. Further investigation suggests that research conducted on Plum Island involved the use of ticks as vectors or carriers for deadly bioweapons. As a European, Traub would have been very aware of the infectious nature of ticks and would realize that if a tick could be impregnated with a disease, then they could become an effective biological weapon. The Plum Island scientists know as well as Traub that insects like mosquitoes and ticks are a highly effective way to spread diseases through animal and human populations. Infected insects can be airdropped over enemy territory to wreak havoc without a single shot being fired. In 1955, the US Air Force carry out a secret germ warfare test, codenamed Operation Big Buzz. To test whether insects could be used to deliver biological weapons, the US Air Force drops 330,000 blood-sucking mosquitoes on the unsuspecting state of Georgia to see how many people they would bite. The answer is thousands. The Plum Island facility carries out research on virulent so-called hot viruses in the now notorious Building 257. The labs are hermetically sealed and scientists conduct their experiments in airtight glove boxes. Plum Island is tiny, but what goes on there is potentially massive. What exactly goes on in Building 257 remains an official secret. What deadly diseases are developed there, and what killer germs escape? One of the problems with germ warfare is that you can't always control the result of it. Sometimes a particular disease that you're using in warfare will spread beyond what you originally intended. According to investigators, one Plum Island microbiologist claims that in 1978, the island was evacuated after one virus escaped the labs. There was construction work on the island, and the virus escaped from the facility, killing the animals on the island. Other former employees claim that on one occasion, ticks were deliberately released. Could these have been the bio-warfare weapons Traub helped develop? Investigators claim to have spoken to a former employee who worked on Plum Island in the 1950s. The man claims to recall ticks being released onto the island, but more importantly, 
the nickname of the individual releasing them was the Nazi scientist. Plum Island has over 140 species of birds living there. Recent research has shown that American birds are now carrying ticks which are infected with the Borrelia bacteria. It is President Nixon who finally puts a stop to the Plum Island Biological Weapons Research Program. At the height of the Cold War in 1969, the newly minted Richard Nixon administration announced that they were stopping all germ warfare and chemical warfare programs. Plum Island is now under the control of the U.S. Department of Homeland Security. Building 257 has been closed. According to the U.S. Center for Disease Control and Prevention, an estimated 300,000 cases of Lyme disease a year are now being diagnosed in the U.S. The U.S. government denies any responsibility for the spread of the disease in the towns close to its germ warfare research lab. If the outbreak of Lyme disease in Connecticut is not linked to Traub and Plum Island, then it has to go down as one of the greatest coincidences in the history of warfare. It's a real-life World War II ghost ship. We've all heard of the Mary Celeste, the ghost ship found sailing without a crew. Well, here's a ghost airship. A crew that vanishes into thin air. The crew's gone. So where do they go? It's a real mystery. Something worthy of a Raymond Chandler novel. In 1872, the Mary Celeste, an American merchant sailing ship, leaves New York Harbor destined for Italy. It is found four weeks later floating in the Atlantic. Everything on board is perfectly normal, but for one thing... The crew is gone. There's no sign of where they went. There's no sign of a struggle. There's no sign of an emergency evacuation. They have just vanished into thin air. It's one of the great mysteries of naval history. Fast forward 70 years to August 1942. A US Navy blimp on a routine Pacific patrol ends its tour in a mystery crash near San Francisco. A US military airship falls from the sky, crashing to earth in a crowded street. There is no obvious cause of this disaster. And stranger still, the crew's gone. So where do they go? The crew have disappeared into thin air. The only signs of life on the ship are a reportedly half-drunk cup of coffee and a half-eaten sandwich. It's a ghost ship, vanished. Where did they go? The US authorities launch an investigation. But the more they uncover, the deeper the mystery becomes. The story of Ghost Ship L-8 starts five years earlier when the luxury airliner Hindenburg, the pride of Nazi Germany, attempts to dock at Lakehurst Naval Air Station in New Jersey. As it's coming into land, one of its hydrogen cells catches fire and, well, we all know the rest. A roar and a burst of flame turn the ship into a flaming inferno. For reasons which remain unexplained, the Zeppelin is destroyed in just seconds, witnessed by horrified onlookers. 36 passengers and crew are killed. Many more suffer horrific burns but survive. US Navy Airman Charles Adams heroically pulls victims from the burning wreckage. He rescued survivors from the Hindenburg who were going up in flames. The heroism of Adams earns him a personal note of thanks from aviation chief and Nazi leader, Hermann Goering. Five years later, Adams is chosen to join experienced pilot Lieutenant Ernest Cody on the US Navy airship L-8, his first mission as a commissioned officer. Cody was a pilot with a history of distinction. He has just received a promotion and moved to San Francisco to do this job. On August the 16th, 1942, 
the L-8 prepares to depart from Treasure Island in San Francisco Bay. Adams and Cody are only too aware of the dangers of airships, and not just because of the Hindenburg disaster. Shortly before their flight, two other Navy airships have gone down, killing 12 people. These things are dangerous. Airships are dangerous, but useful. They can hover and remain airborne for long periods, which makes them an ideal eye in the sky for naval patrols. This was in the days before helicopters, so airships and blimps were used extensively for anti-submarine warfare. Airship L-8 is on a mission to hunt for Japanese subs. The L-8 blimp is equipped with two powerful depth charges and smoke bombs to mark the position of any enemy submarines. The mission will take Cody and Adams east over the Golden Gate Bridge and out over the Pacific. After a 90-minute flight, they send a message to the U.S. naval base in San Francisco. Heading one zero, one two. Cody radios that he spotted an oil slick just beyond the Farallon Islands. An oil slick is a telltale sign of an enemy vessel. Could a Japanese submarine be in trouble off the coast of California? It is about this time fishermen witness the airship and its crew flying low over the area. Two nearby fishing vessels watch as the blimp circles for about an hour investigating the oil slick. The fishermen then see the airship heading back towards San Francisco. But back at base, flight command are getting worried. Cody and Adams are not responding to radio calls. Concerned by the radio silence, the US Navy sends out a search party and puts out radio appeals for information. At 10.49 a.m., a flying boat reports seeing the L-8. And at 11, the Navy's own aircraft reports the airship flying normally three miles west of Salada Beach before disappearing into the clouds. The crew of the L-8 are never seen or heard of again. At 11.15, a solitary bather notices the blimp drifting 50 feet from the shore. The blimp is sagging in the middle and it's careering across the shore. The airship drifts inland, moving sideways to the wind. Something is obviously very wrong. Sunday morning golfers at an exclusive San Francisco club look on in horror as it crashes into a cliff and releases part of its payload. One of the depth charges hits the ground, but mercifully, it doesn't go off. Without the weight of the 325-pound bomb, the stricken airship rises again and heads further inland, completely at the mercy of the wind. At this point, the blimp comes drifting into the city, smashing into telephone poles, power lines, it eventually crashes on top of two cars just outside of Bellevue Avenue. Cody and Adams are nowhere to be seen. Investigators are at a loss to explain what's happened. They found no signs of panic or struggle inside of the gondola. The only things that were missing were the two life jackets, which the crew were required to wear. One curious fact is when they inspected the blimp, they found that the door had been opened during flight. That's the equivalent of having a car door open on the motorway. It just makes no sense. There has been no positive sightings of the crew since the fishermen saw them early that morning, near the suspicious oil slick. A Navy search and rescue mission begins. Life jackets were designed to keep bodies afloat indefinitely. So if you were looking for these individuals in the bay and you knew the general area where they were, there's no reason why you couldn't have found them. But no bodies are ever recovered, and the Navy's investigation is ultimately inconclusive. There was a great deal of speculation about this outside of the official inquest. There are so many unanswered questions. If there was trouble on board, why didn't they radio in? 
Could someone else have sneaked onto the airship? A saboteur who killed the crew and then escaped? The stowaway theory is pretty much a non-starter. The weight of every airship is calibrated and checked very carefully before every flight. If a stowaway was on board, the crew would have felt the weight, and there was also nowhere to hide. If a spy had been after some sort of classified information, probably wouldn't have left behind Cody's briefcase full of top secret mission documents. Another theory is that the crew are somehow captured by a Japanese submarine as they inspect the oil slick. But it's hard to imagine how, and there are no signs of a struggle having taken place. Everything is exactly where it should be. The life raft is stowed, the parachutes are still there, even the radio works. Investigators consider whether Cody and Adams could have deserted. But both men are experienced and committed officers with families. These guys do not fit the profile of deserters. This is the guy who ran into the raging inferno of the Hindenburg to pull people out alive. This guy's a hero. He's not a quitter. Amid the new space age fever of the post-war years, there is even speculation about alien abduction. But then in 1947, Cody's now remarried wife writes to the Navy. She claims her mother spotted Cody in Arizona. She said his eyes looked peculiar and he had a strange blank stare. But the peculiar looking man is never seen again. Mysteries like this always give rise to rumors and speculation and conspiracy theories. The uncertainty is something that we don't want to deal with, and so we look for answers and we try to make sense of things. To this day, the fate of the crew of the ghost airship remains unknown. The magicians who used their magic to beat the Nazis. The spy who hates me. The German James Bond who double-crossed Hitler. Multiple sightings of UFOs over wartime Canada. And the Pearl Harbor conspiracy. How much did Churchill know? Conflict on a scale never seen before or since. A new kind of war. This is war at its weirdest. Bizarre experimental weapons. Mysterious events. Conspiracies and cover-ups. When governments destroy files, you can't help but wonder why. Unexplained phenomena. The RAF doesn't have an explanation for the crew's report. When a world goes to war with itself, things get weird. Now you see it, now you don't. Out of thin air, British lorries suddenly become British tanks. No one has a clue what's going on. What happened when the British army sent magicians to fight Hitler? It seems impossible, but the accounts are covered in numerous history books. The biggest magic spell in history. And a devastating blow to the Nazis. The British are pioneers of the art of illusion. In the early decades of the 20th century, no music hall variety show was complete without one or more magic acts. World famous artists like Harry Houdini invent and perfect techniques for conning large audiences. Objects and people are made to vanish, to levitate, to appear from nowhere, to transform into something else completely. It sounds crazy, but when war was declared against Germany, the British High Command recruited magicians to fight the Nazis, including famous illusionist Jasper Maskelyne. Their mission? To use their magic to make whole armies disappear. The art of camouflage and other tricks of deception were pioneered in World War I. Dummy heads made of plaster were used in the trenches to tempt and expose enemy snipers. But deception was to be taken to a new level in World War II. British magicians are recruited into Allied camouflage units 
and teamed up with artists, carpenters, painters, and set builders to create the biggest magic tricks ever performed. The magicians are no longer pulling rabbits out of hats. They must turn jeeps into tanks, tanks into trucks, and make whole armies appear and disappear. Britain's illusionist unit, the Camouflage Directorate, is led by film director Geoffrey Barkas. And it's in North Africa, against the German forces of the desert fox, Erwin Rommel, that they perform the greatest magic trick in history. June 1942. Rommel's panzer regiments are blazing across the desert plains of Libya. The Allies are in real trouble. Rommel is driving through North Africa and he's heading towards Cairo. Churchill knows that if he loses North Africa, he could lose the war. Rommel must be stopped. He turns to his greatest general, Field Marshal Montgomery, known as Monty to his men. But Rommel is expecting an attack and he is a master of desert warfare. His Africa Corps is camped in the flat, empty desert around El Alamein. They can see for miles around. There is no chance of a surprise attack. Monty needs a miracle, or a bit of magic. To perform it, he turns to the magicians in the camouflage directorate. Barker's unit was responsible for deception on a fantastically ambitious scale. Montgomery was convinced that there was a role for movie magic in warfare. So he challenged Barkas to turn the Libyan desert into the world's largest stage set and put on a performance for the German spies. Monty's problem is how to get to the enemy camp without being noticed. Put simply, Monty wants Barkas to find a way to get his army into position on the northern front without tipping off the Germans. If it works, it will alter the course of the war. All they have to do is move tanks and artillery within range of the German front, across a flat, open desert, without the Germans noticing. The deception unit decides to perform a classic trick used by illusionists. You repeatedly show the audience one thing, then when they're bored of looking, you switch it for something else. But it'll be tough, because the Germans are watching like hawks. The Allies only have two realistic options. A railway line to the north and a desert road to the south but Rommel is watching every move they make. The trick begins with what magicians call the convincer. The Germans are looking for tanks. They're not concerned with a bunch of abandoned trucks by the side of the road. Close to their camp, the Germans spot a large number of abandoned, broken down trucks. Now it's time for what magicians call the inspection. The Germans check out the trucks there's nothing unusual. These are real trucks. Day after day, the trucks sit there. But then, under the cover of darkness and over the course of two nights, one by one, the real trucks are removed from the road. Here's where those trucks abandoned by the Northern Railway Line come in. They were planted there weeks earlier for just this purpose. They are replaced with tanks disguised to look exactly like the trucks. Barkas and his team designed these ingenious canvas covers called sun shields for tanks and guns so that from the air, Axis aerial reconnaissance, they look like supply trucks. These sun shields, they hide artillery, tanks, they're just like a modern-day Trojan horse. It's what magicians call the switch. <laughs> the Germans believe Monty's tanks, still visible by spotter aircraft, are far to the north. But these are, in fact, trucks. Tanks that look like trucks and canvas sheets that look like tanks. The stage was set. Operation Bertram, the biggest magic trick in history, has begun. 
Now it's time for stage two. German intelligence reports activity on the southern road. They note the presence of tanks, guns, and even a water pipe being built to it. They become convinced that if a counterattack is going to come, it'll be on the south road. But the magicians are about to employ two classic tricks, known as flashing and misdirection. Show the audience what they're not supposed to see, then redirect their attention. Monty's magicians have moved up three and a half field regiments of dummy artillery. But the Germans can tell their dummies, designed to distract them from an attack which will, they assume, come from elsewhere. Once again, under cover of night, the dummy artillery is gradually replaced with real artillery, made to look like bad dummy artillery. When the sun comes up on October the 23rd, everything looks the same. So the Germans wake up to find that nothing has changed. The only road to the north is essentially still a British lorry park. German lookouts can see for miles, but there's nothing but broken lorries and badly camouflaged dummy artillery. The Germans are totally oblivious to the fact that Monty has moved an attack force and is ready to go. When Monty gives the signal, it's like a magician pulling back the veil. They'd been there all the time. They'd literally been parked on the front line, right under the Germans' noses. The Germans are amazed as the canvas covers are flung open and scores of tank turrets turn to face them. At the same time, three and a half regiments of unconvincing dummy guns open fire on Rommel's unsuspecting army. Germans are utterly stunned. Just how did the hundred tanks appear out of thin air? The German army is thrown into total confusion. The biggest magic trick in history is a devastating success. It's shocking. Half a million shells rain down on the bewildered German army. Their forces are in total disarray as British tanks that have appeared out of thin air roar across the open desert. In the ensuing chaos, 25,000 German and Italian troops are killed or injured. The master tactician Erwin Rommel has failed and the German army is forced into a humiliating retreat, eventually to abandon Africa altogether ignoring Hitler's demands that they stay and fight to the death. The Allies have trounced the Desert Fox. And they've done it with smoke and mirrors. When, in the British Parliament, Winston Churchill announces victory in the Battle of El Alamein, he makes special mention of Operation Bertram and the masters of illusion who outfoxed the fox. Operation Bertram was a piece of military magic. After the disaster at Dunkirk, it was a much-needed success for the British. Masculine wrote in his memoirs, the focus of my whole attention is to mobilize the world of magic against Hitler. Coming up... The greatest double agent in history, the master spy who duped Hitler. This was a very dangerous game. If Canaris was found out, the best he could hope for was a swift execution in front of a firing squad. But as a double agent, he can expect much worse from the Gestapo. World War II Germans. Super intelligent, ruthless, technically advanced and mega efficient. You would have thought the Germans would have made great spies. All across occupied Europe, German agents were completely outwitted by the Allied resistance, and they weren't much better behind enemy lines. The story of why German spies were so rubbish is one of the strangest stories of World War II. They were hopeless. September 1940. 
in the small hours of the morning, a German Heinkel seaplane touches down off the coast of Scotland. Three German spies climb out of the plane, two men and one stunningly beautiful woman. They climb into a boat and make for shore. Once on land, they split up, but their spying mission is over before it even begins. The spies have thick German accents. And when the police look inside their bags, they find German radio sets, code books and pistols. It's as if they're a comedy spy troupe. The spies are arrested. The woman becomes a prisoner of MI5, and the men are later hanged at Wandsworth Prison. This is far from the only bungled German covert operation. Another German spy is arrested in Scotland, cycling on the wrong side of the road with a big German sausage sticking out of his rucksack. Why were German espionage operations so comically bad? The weird answer lies with the German Secret Service. When Hitler comes to power, the country already has a secret intelligence organisation. It was called the Abwehr and was Germany's equivalent to Britain's MI6 or the American OSS. Germany's spymaster is Wilhelm Canaris, a former naval intelligence officer. Canaris, who was awarded the rank of Admiral, is regarded even by his enemies as one of the greatest spies of his generation. Brilliant and devious, he is known by senior Nazis as the Fox. But like all good spies, Canaris has a secret. Ever since Canaris witnessed the first wave of Nazi atrocities against Jews and others in Poland, he developed an abiding hatred of the Nazis. In one of the most daring intelligence operations in history, Canaris decides to use Germany's own secret service to double-cross the Nazi regime. This was a very dangerous game. If Canaris was found out, the best he could hope for was a swift execution in front of a firing squad. But as a double agent, he can expect much worse from the Gestapo. He knew from experience that the Nazis had much nastier ways of making you pay for betraying them. First, Canaris has to persuade Hitler to trust and rely on Germany's secret service. So Abwehr spies have to show their effectiveness. Among many successful Abwehr missions, Canaris's spies are sent to Ireland to persuade the Irish Republican Army, or IRA, to attack British munition factories. When in 1940, the IRA blows up an arms factory in Waltham Abbey, Hitler is delighted. But all the while, Canaris is appointing secret anti-Nazis to key positions in the Abwehr. His deputy, who runs day-to-day -day operations, the head of the Abwehr's Section Z, is Major General Hans Oster. As far as Hitler is concerned, he is another brilliant Nazi master spy. In fact, Oster is secretly a guiding figure in Germany's resistance movement, helping Jews to escape the Nazis. These senior German spies begin playing a complicated game of double bluff to undermine the Nazis and help the Allies. Germany's secret service now set out to undermine the very regime they were supposed to support. To spy on Britain, the Abwehr send fanatical Hitler supporters who have little training in espionage and poor language skills. The Abwehr knows that the British will capture them. When these spies arrived in Britain with their foreign accents, carrying incriminating materials, transmitters, things like that, there was clearly a real risk that they were going to be caught quickly and tried and hanged by the British authorities. When it comes to spying on the US, Canaris uses the same trick. Canaris launched Operation Pastorius. Now, as far as Hitler was concerned, the aim of Pastorius was to send a legion of German spies to America in order to sabotage the war effort eager to prove that the United States is vulnerable despite its distance from Europe. Hitler's plan is sabotage. Among the targets are New York's water supply, the Ohio Railroad, and Jewish-owned department stores. 
Eight men are picked for the operation and enrolled in a crash course in sabotage. With training in munitions, grenades, guns and jujitsu, the agents are ready for their mission. Armed with phony identities and $100,000, the men split and disperse to various American cities. But on arriving, one of Canaris's agents heads straight to the American Secret Service and exposes the whole operation. Within weeks of arriving in America, almost all the Nazi agents were arrested by the FBI. But Canaris isn't done yet. Before the war, he had contact with Churchill, whom he greatly admires. Once the war starts, he sends an Abwehr agent to Switzerland to establish lines of communication with Alan Dulles, an American spy who would later become head of the CIA. They came up with a set of protocols that enabled the Abwehr to feed information to the American Secret Service. Canaris is even thought to have personally met with C, the head of British intelligence, at a safe house in Algiers. Little does Hitler know it, but key members of his own secret service are now working directly with the Allies. The Abwehr is both leaking information to the Allies and feeding false information to the Nazi high command. This becomes critical when Hitler decides to conquer Britain. Hitler's plan to invade Britain is codenamed Operation Sea Lion. All-out invasion is to take place imminently. But Canaris has other ideas. First, the German Secret Service provides Churchill with details of Hitler's plan of attack well in advance. When the Luftwaffe reach the skies over Britain, they are shocked to discover the RAF waiting for them. But that's not all. Canaris' spies deliberately provide false information to Hitler and his generals. The Abwehr informs Hitler that Britain's south coast is heavily defended by 40 divisions of troops. In reality, they know that Britain is vulnerable to attack, with just 16 divisions available. It's this Abwehr lie that stops Hitler attempting a land invasion. Meanwhile, Germany's Secret Service is keeping close tabs on all senior Nazis. But there is one Nazi they're especially interested in. SS Obergruppenführer Reinhard Heydrich is head of the Gestapo, the Nazis' feared secret police. Reinhard Heydrich was a general in the SS and the ultimate head of the Gestapo. He mistrusted the Abwehr so much that he once had a special SS burglary unit to break into their offices and rifle through their files. But Canaris' spies are good. They believe that Heydrich, one of Hitler's main henchmen, is part Jewish. This is something the head of the Gestapo does not want Hitler to find out about. Canaris, meanwhile, is careful to stay close to the Fuhrer. Canaris was a canny operator. He was very careful to maintain good personal relations with Hitler, and his Abwehr spies could easily outwit the officers of the SS. But the British Secret Service doesn't want to take chances with Heydrich. They value Germany's double-dealing spies. The Gestapo boss cannot be allowed to expose them. What follows is one of the most extraordinary operations of the war. It seems the British intelligence service, with the help of the Czech resistance, decides to assassinate the head of the Gestapo in order to protect Hitler's secret service. The Abwehr agent in Czechoslovakia was Paul Tummel, who was a senior German spy who was working very closely both with the Czech resistance and with the British Special Operations Executive. In May 1942, as Heydrich is being driven via Prague to a meeting with Hitler, his open-top Mercedes-Benz is ambushed. Heydrich survives the attack, but is badly wounded. And a week later, he dies. But now things start going wrong for Canaris. The German Secret Service has already lent its support to more than one assassination attempt on Hitler, but without success. Now Canaris' luck runs out. Heydrich had confided his doubts about the Abwehr to Heinrich Himmler, 
who, along with other senior Nazis, had grown very suspicious of their own secret service. After another failed assassination attempt on Hitler, the infamous July 20 plot, the Gestapo moves in. Canaris is arrested. The Nazis abolish the Abwehr, and they arrested Canaris for being a traitor. They sent him to Flossenburg concentration camp. And it was there, on April the 9th, 1945, just 21 days before Hitler shot himself in the bunker, that they hanged him. One of the greatest spies of his generation has finally been caught. But the damage is already done. Canaris was one of the great unsung heroes of the war. It's a resistance story that is rarely told, of how the double agents of Germany's secret service used their extraordinary cunning, risked and sacrificed their lives to destroy the Nazis. Panic in North America, as unidentified flying objects pass overhead. The eyewitnesses don't know what these things are. Whole cities suddenly plunged into darkness. But when the dust settles, there's no sign of enemy aircraft or indeed of anything else. A bizarre UFO mystery that continues to this day. Valentine's Day, Sunday, February the 14th, 1915. Brockville, a small manufacturing town on Canada's St. Lawrence River. Worshippers are returning home from evening service. Young couples are out promenading. Suddenly, three large, strange objects are seen flying overhead. The crowd looks on first in amazement and then terror as the objects throw down shafts and balls of light. According to some reports, the town's streets have been lit up by searchlights from these objects. Fireballs have been dropped and the entire place is in a state of panic. With the town in alarm, Brockville's mayor, Donaldson, makes an urgent direct call to Canada's Prime Minister, Sir Robert Borden. Whatever these three flying objects are, they are headed in the direction of Ottawa, the capital city. The Prime Minister calls out the Dominion Police and the Canadian military. The capital's police commissioner orders an immediate blackout of government buildings. Further reports come in of sightings. Farmers claim to have spotted unexplained flying craft close to the capital. And if that doesn't scream UFO, then what does? These are not the only sightings. Guards on the Canadian side of Niagara Falls report seeing mysterious red, green and yellow lights shining in different combinations from the American side. People are seriously on edge. In the capital, news spreads of the approaching objects. Militia marksmen take up positions at strategic points around Parliament Hill and key locations in Ottawa are plunged into darkness. The capital holds its breath, waiting for the strange craft to arrive. But they fail to appear. The following night, Ottawa is blacked out. But again, there are no sightings and no attacks. But the UFO sightings keep coming. Between 1914 and 1916, there are numerous reports of phantom craft flying above Quebec and Ontario provinces. No one can explain them, but there is speculation. Could these flying craft somehow be connected with the terrible war in Europe? The First World War is six months old. As part of the British Empire, Canada has automatically joined the war effort. It's one of the quirks of empire that despite being over 4,000 miles away, the Canadians become involved. Canada is formally at war with Germany. Is it possible that Germany is attacking them with some novel weapon? Advancements in aeronautical engineering have been so rapid in the first years of the century, Canadians aren't sure what the enemy is capable of. England is experiencing the first ever Zeppelin air raids. For the people of London, it is terrifying. Giant floating ships raining bombs from the skies. It's a new kind of weapon in a new type of war. 
Apparently, Kaiser Wilhelm initially did not want London to be bombed. His very, very close ties to the British royal family meant that he was extremely reluctant to be seen as having destroyed Britain's cultural heritage. For the Kaiser, Canada is an enemy and a legitimate target. But could the lights in the sky really be a German airship or some such weapon? It will be another four years before the first successful airplane flight across the Atlantic. More than 10 years before the Graf Zeppelin makes its famous transatlantic crossing. During the entire course of the First World War, not one German aircraft is recorded as having flown over Canada. The Germans don't have the aeronautical technology in World War I to fly from Europe to Canada. So these mysterious objects simply can't have been the Kaiser's aircraft. But what if the Kaiser had sent these strange craft not from Germany, but from neutral America? Suspicion turns to Germans living south of the border in the USA. At this stage of the First World War, Canada's immediate neighbor to the south, the United States, has not even entered into the conflict. And rumors are rife that these alleged attacks are the work of German Americans. At the time, 10 million German Americans are living in the US. Canadians fear that many German Americans will feel allegiance to the Kaiser. In America, as the war intensifies, anti-German feeling grows. German-sounding streets, foods, schools, businesses, and even cities are being renamed. Tensions run so high that some civilians with German ancestry are assaulted and even hanged by vigilantes. There is talk in Canada of German espionage. Fear spreads that enemy bombing raids will be launched on Canada using airships taking off from American soil. Shots are fired at an American plane crossing the border. One wild accusation suggests there's a secret German army, 80,000 strong, just ready to invade Canada. But the fears are groundless. The Kaiser's war is not popular among ordinary Germans. It later transpires that much of the anti-German fear-mongering is the result of slanderous British propaganda. This is all rubbish. The British Consul General in New York, Sir Courtney Bennett, is eventually found to have been the one starting all these anti-German smears. But what then with the weird craft in the sky that caused terror on Valentine night? According to another theory, they're the work of the French. To many French Canadians, the war in Europe feels like a British war. Army recruitment officers across Canada are packed, but the volunteers are almost all British Canadians. Many English Canadians hadn't long arrived in Canada, and they were desperate to fight for their king. Controversially, of the 33,000 Canadian soldiers who did sign up, only 3% were French Canadians. As the war rages, tensions grow between English and French Canadians. The English language press condemns French Canadians as cowards. In defense of the French Canadians, most of them had never set foot in Europe before, and they didn't want to be ordered around in a language they didn't even understand. In response to the controversy, Canadian Prime Minister Robert Borden brings in a new law to conscript Canadians into the army. But Canadians, French and English alike, angrily defy the law. Out of 400,000 men conscripted, only 20,000 turn up. Many French Canadians head for the hills. Men were avoiding conscription by any means, often hiding out in the wilderness of Canada in lumber camps. The French Canadian message was clear. This was not their war. Hiding away in the woods, evading conscription, the French Canadians clearly had neither the resources nor motivation to build strange flying machines to attack their English countrymen. Throughout the First World War, there were loads of sightings of strange objects in the skies. Today, we'd simply call them UFOs, and it didn't end with World War I. 25th of February, 1942. In the early hours of the 25th, American radar operators detect an unidentified object just 120 miles west of LA. Anti-aircraft batteries are put on alert. The object is tracked to within a few miles of the coast. 
Suddenly, air raid sirens wail out all over Los Angeles. Japanese aircraft have been spotted over the city. An attack seems imminent. Thousands of air raid wardens are ordered to their positions. Two million lives are at stake. The city is plunged into darkness. Los Angeles, for the only time in its history, is completely blacked out. The first shots are fired into the sky. At what? Nobody really knows for sure. At 3.16 a.m., the Coastal Artillery Brigade start firing 50 caliber machine guns and anti-aircraft rounds into the sky. For the next hour, the skies above LA are lit up. By the time the all clear sounds at 4.14 a.m., 1,400 rounds of ammunition have been discharged into the sky. But at what? No planes have been downed, no airships or other aircraft grounded. The only damage to the city has been caused by shell fragments landing on the buildings. As the dust settles, the Secretary of the Navy announces that it was all a false alarm and just the result of war nerves. Angelinos are in shock. Conflicting opinions between the Army and the Navy on what happened do nothing to calm the public down. Then, the Los Angeles Times publishes one of the most iconic and controversial images of the entire war. And you can certainly see why. Spotlights are seen honing in on a strange-shaped object. Shells burst all around it. UFOologists insist it is evidence of an alien craft. If there was nothing in the sky, what are all the spotlights and gunfire aiming at? Decades apart, both the sightings in Brockville and the famous siege of LA remain a mystery. The truth behind Brockville is that it may well have been just some pranksters with some balloons and fireworks looking to provoke panic in a very jittery Canadian population. But to this day, there is still no satisfactory explanation for the three flying objects which were seen throwing down balls of light and moving across the sky on Valentine's night in 1915. One thing is certain, war does very funny things to people's imaginations, and we may never know what was in those wartime skies. It's a mystery. Coming up, the Great Pearl Harbor cover-up. A shocking accusation. If true, it will rewrite history. The man sitting on the secret is none other than wartime hero Winston Churchill. British agents sent undercover to infiltrate American society. And also involved are the children's writer Roald Dahl and the James Bond creator Ian Fleming. What lies did the British tell to bring America into the war? June 1940, France falls to the Nazis. The future is looking bleak. Hitler's war machine is gearing up to invade Britain. Planning for Operation Sea Line has begun. Britain is fighting on her own. She faces the combined might of the Axis powers, Germany, Japan and Italy. The only hope for Britain and for freedom is America. The problem Churchill has is that the USA does not want to get involved in another European war. There are a third of a million American casualties in the First World War. A senseless conflict between old imperial powers. Here is another crazy war which has nothing to do with them. Another war, not for me. This time America should keep out and I know I will but they have a democratic president who seems itching for a fight. But you also have the isolationists, and they're very worried that President Roosevelt's policies are making it increasingly likely that America's gonna be dragged into another costly European war. After the horrors of the Civil War and the Great War, most Americans just want peace. Among them are six million German Americans. To win support for the third term in office, Roosevelt makes a pledge. He's quoted as saying, 
I've said it before, and I shall say it again and again, your boys are not going to be sent into any foreign wars. It's a disaster for Britain. But Churchill sets out to change America's mind. Recently declassified files show just how far the British Prime Minister is prepared to go to pull America into the war. In May 1940, he authorises a covert operation to be carried out by a British spy ring. The organisation is called the British Security Coordination, or the BSC for short. It's led by Canadian spymaster William Stevenson, who has a vast network of agents. And also involved are the children's writer Roald Dahl and the James Bond creator Ian Fleming. Their mission is to infiltrate American society at the highest level. Sabotage, propaganda and political subversion will all be used to force America to go to war. The BSC's activities were kept secret because if news of them got out, it would clearly damage the relationship between Britain and the United States. But the BSC files also show that Roosevelt knew that this was going on. The agents launch a covert propaganda campaign. Americans who oppose the war find themselves accused as Nazi sympathizers. American companies deemed to be working against British interest come under attack. Meanwhile, Roald Dahl had infiltrated the upper echelons of American society. He was a regular guest at the White House and he'd made important contacts with American publishers. By 1941, Roosevelt and his hawkish supporters are edging America ever closer towards war. At this juncture, the U.S. is not officially at war with anyone. However, let's be real. They're firing on German U-boats. They're creating economic embargoes against Japan. And they're moving the might of their military to Pearl Harbor. So you might say the handwriting's on the wall. Then Japan's Imperial forces hit Pearl Harbor. Two and a half thousand men and women are killed. Americans demand revenge. When news of the attack reaches Churchill, he is said to be jubilant. But some investigators believe the attack did not come as a surprise to Churchill. It's one of the great hot topics for American and British historians. Just how much do the Allies know about the American Pearl Harbor attack in advance? It's not just the British who are said to have known. A wartime double agent called Dusko Popov will later claim that he warned FBI Chief J. Edgar Hoover of the Pearl Harbor attack four months before it took place. The FBI subsequently denied receiving that warning, and Hoover denied ever even meeting Popov. Did the British and American establishments conspire to con the American people? In 1991, Two researchers, James Rusbridger and Eric Nave, make a stunning accusation. They claim that the British knew all about the impending Japanese attack, but were determined to keep this from the Americans. According to their theory, the man sitting on the secret is none other than wartime hero Winston Churchill. The accusation is extraordinary, and yet it seems to come from an authoritative source. Rusbridger is said to have been an Eastern Europe courier for British intelligence. Rusbridger, a Secret Service operative, and Nave, a naval cryptographer during the war. Nave may have had direct knowledge of America's attempts to break the Japanese naval code, JN-25. JN-25 was the Japanese's very sophisticated, highly coded messaging mechanism. If the Americans can only break JN-25, it will give them vital intelligence of the movements of the Japanese fleet. The United States had spent a number of years trying to decode it, and while they were making slow but relatively sure progress, in the run-up to Pearl Harbor, the Japanese were tweaking it and that effectively rendered all the effort from the United States basically useless. It is alleged the Americans turn to British codebreakers for help, but instead they are betrayed. The allegations that some investigators retain to this day is that Britain had in fact cracked JN25, 
but they withheld it from the Americans. According to Rusbridger and Nave, weeks before the Pearl Harbor attack, British codebreakers decipher a Japanese military communication on opening hostilities with the United States. But the British keep the information to themselves. The crux of this conspiracy is that the crucial information is not passed to the Americans. On the 2nd of December 1941, just five days before the attack on Pearl Harbor, the British are alleged to have intercepted another crucial coded message from the Japanese Admiral Isiroku Yamamoto. It states, climb Mount Nitaka, 1208. Some people believe this could be the code to commence the attack. So 12 would stand for the month, and 8 would stand for the day in Tokyo, which, given the time difference, would be the 7th in Hawaii. There were no Japanese naval fleets advancing on Singapore or the Philippines. Hawaii was the only other logical destination. This is the information that could have stopped Pearl Harbor from being a surprise attack. If the British did deduce that the Japanese fleet was heading for Pearl Harbor, they could have saved thousands of lives by passing this on to the Americans. Winston Churchill stands accused of having sacrificed innocent American lives to bring the US into the war. It's almost sacrilege to suggest that Churchill would not tell Roosevelt of a pending attack. But with a plethora of files that remain classified or have gone missing, one cannot help but be suspicious. But not everyone believes that Churchill knew. It has been argued that British codebreakers had not cracked enough of the JN25 cipher to read Japanese naval communications. The Japanese, too, have denied sending any messages while en route to Pearl Harbor. Although mainstream historians have rejected the allegation that Churchill knew that this attack was going to happen, there's no doubt that America was aware that some attack at some point was a possibility. In 2011, a typewritten American naval intelligence memo is discovered buried in a declassified file. Dated the 4th of December 1941, the memo states that Hawaii is one of three targets identified by Japan in anticipation of possible open conflict. The rumor is that Roosevelt had warning a full three days before the attack on Pearl Harbor and yet did absolutely nothing about it. The document gives no specific details, but it is a clear warning of a likely attack. If Roosevelt and his advisors had indications that an attack was a possibility, why did this attack come as such a surprise? Roosevelt was in secret communication with Churchill. He wanted to help the British, but he had vowed to keep America out of the war. Only a direct attack on America would allow him to go back on that pledge. Only an openly aggressive act would give him the get-out that he needed. Pearl Harbor did exactly that. On balance, most historians believe the Americans knew an attack was imminent. They just didn't know where or when. Roosevelt, however, never anticipated the magnitude that this attack would have. Coming up on World War Weird, the Roswell UFO, Stalin's close encounter with a flying saucer, a giant ghost army that takes on Hitler and wins, and prostitutes, Nazis and aliens, the weird disappearance of Glenn Miller. Conflict on a scale never seen before or since. A new kind of war. This is war at its weirdest. Bizarre experimental weapons. Mysterious events. Conspiracies and cover-ups. When governments destroy files, you can't help but wonder why. Unexplained phenomena 
The RAF doesn't have an explanation for the crew's report. When a world goes to war with itself, things get weird. Eyewitnesses report a mysterious craft crashing in the desert outside Roswell, New Mexico. The Roswell crash has become one of the most famous UFO incidents of all time, with allegations of crashes, cover-ups, and alien autopsies. But is this flying saucer the work of aliens, Nazis, or communists? If true, it's the weirdest story to come out of the Second World War. Roswell, USA, July 1947. A local newspaper, the Roswell Daily Record, reports that a flying disc or saucer has landed on a ranch outside town. The rancher has called the sheriff, who in turn calls Roswell Army Air Base. A press briefing from Roswell Army spokesman confirms that an unidentified flying saucer has indeed crash-landed and has been taken away to Roswell base. The remains of an unidentified flying disc have been recovered from a farm just north of the base. But the following day, the official Air Force story changes. The flying disc is now said to have been a weather balloon. But many locals are skeptical of the new official explanation. Eyewitnesses from the time describe strange metal debris and a bright, unidentified object crashing to the ground. They also report the whole area being closed down by the military to retrieve bodies. This does not sound like standard protocol when a balloon goes down. Some of them concluded that the Roswell crash was, in fact, an alien spacecraft and that an alien corpse had been recovered from the crash site. The Roswell incident ignites public interest in these new flying saucers. Hollywood responds with a wave of flying saucer movies. The US government sticks to the official explanation. But years after the Roswell incident, the government is forced to release official documents relating to the case. 30 years later, there were investigations by various groups that used public records and the Freedom of Information Act to investigate the Roswell crash. Many investigators now claim there has been a government cover-up. Among them is Pulitzer Prize-nominated American journalist Annie Jacobson. According to Jacobson's version of events, the story of Roswell starts four years before the crash, as World War II is still raging. 1943, and the Allies are gaining air superiority over the skies of Europe. Hermann Goering tells his aircraft designers to come up with new aircraft way beyond the Allies' capabilities to turn the tide of the war. The only way Goering's plans can be met is by using jet engine technology. Nazi aviation engineers come up with a range of revolutionary new designs for a flying craft. Two designers, the brothers Walter and Reimar Horton, invent the flying wing. It utilizes jet engines that are already in use on the superfast Messerschmitt ME262, one of the world's first ever functioning jet planes. The Horton superplane isn't just fast. The design looks nothing like a conventional airplane. It's like a flying triangle. But now, to build it. The work is farmed out to the Gotha Aircraft Factory, who frantically built prototype after prototype. They finally fly HO229 in February of 1945. The flying wing is fast, but speed isn't the only thing Goering is after. As runways are being destroyed at the end of the war, Hitler wants a craft with vertical takeoff and landing capabilities. German scientists believe that the most practical way of doing this is by converting the flying wing into a flying disc or saucer. 
two other German aviation designers, Arthur Sack and Victor Schauberger, are known to have been working on flying saucer designs. It just shows how far ahead of the game the Nazis were. The Allies are aware that the Nazis were well ahead of them in the field of rocket science. The Nazi V-2 rocket is the first man-made object to leave the Earth's atmosphere. Hitler believes that his weird sci-fi wonder weapons will allow the Nazis to secure world domination. Joseph Goebbels, the propaganda minister for the Nazi state, talked about how German wonder weapons would turn the tide of the war and strike fear into the hearts of the Allies. But it is not until the closing days of World War II that the Allies discover how advanced Hitler's rocket program is. On April 14th, just weeks before Germany's official surrender, American troops from the 3rd Army 7 Corps unearth a hidden stash near the Gotha Aircraft Factory in Frederick Roder, Germany. What they found was scattered parts of airplanes, schematics, plans, blueprints. No complete aircraft, but what they found seemed to be far beyond the technological capabilities of the Allies at that time. The Nazi rocket scientists have been working on a range of flying craft which, to the US military, look like the stuff of science fiction. Rumors start to circulate that the craft is the world's first stealth plane, capable of evading detection by Allied radar. This revolutionary stealth aircraft can fly up to 719 miles an hour. That's 300 miles per hour faster than the Spitfire. From the plans at the Gotha Works, it seems that Hitler's top scientists have been working on futuristic, long-range, super-fast craft with stealth capabilities. Hitler being able to bomb US soil put the fear of God into the Americans. It was their worst nightmare. Now the race is on. Not just to win the war, but to stop this technology falling into the hands of the communists. As one terrible war is finishing, a new terrifying Cold War is starting. But the incredible pioneering work of Hitler's rocket scientists comes too late to save Hitler. The Nazis' experimental wonder weapon program comes to a sudden halt as Allied forces sweep into Germany at the start of 1945. At the conclusion of the war in Europe, there was a massive rush on the part of the Allied countries to get their hands on as much German wartime technology as possible. There were prototypes, schematics, plans, and generally a lot of knowledge locked up in the archives of the Nazi administration. Special intelligence units are set up by the American and British governments to track down Hitler scientists and gather together all their work on advanced wonder weapons. This includes plans for experimental, futuristic flying craft. But American Secret Service agents aren't the only ones hunting down Nazi rocket scientists. They've been joined by Stalin's NKVD, the precursors of the KGB. As World War II is finishing, the Cold War is starting. In the race to find Hitler's rocket scientists, the Americans have a problem. By the end of the war, Stalin's communist forces occupy half of Germany. Many of the aviation labs, many of the blueprints, models and prototypes designed and built by Hitler's rocket men are now in the hands of the communists. Suddenly, it's possible that the Soviets might have a prototype stealth bomber. With the Cold War looming, this is exactly what the Allies don't want to happen. The US Army manages to capture 100 rockets and 14 tons of technical documents. American agents capture the chief missile design engineer at the Henschel Aircraft Factory. Then, they capture Hitler's biggest expert on electronic warfare and several other high-ranking scientists, including the man behind the V2, Werner von Braun. 
and after a major intelligence investigation called Operation Harris, the Horton brothers are tracked down, the aviation designers behind Hitler's futuristic flying wing. They are interrogated by US agents, but it's not good news. Walter Horton tells the Americans that he and his brother never worked for the Russians. But in his opinion, there were enough blueprints of their flying wing designs in circulation that they could easily have fallen into Soviet hands. It's not just the Horton's work that has fallen under Soviet control. The Rymarg underground factory, one of the leading wonder weapon research centers, is now in Soviet-controlled East Germany. Hitler's wonder weapons are now Stalin's wonder weapons. Nazi flying saucer research is now in the hands of Soviet scientists. Under Operation Paperclip, the Americans lure German scientists to the US with the promise of amnesty for their crimes, American passports, and government jobs. The Russian equivalent, Operation Ossovakin, is different. Stalin simply sends in the NKVD. Thousands of Nazi scientists are led away at gunpoint. They will now work for Stalin, or else they will be shot. The Americans can only guess at what these scientists are now working on. But two years after the end of the war, an alien-looking flying disc is seen to crash at a ranch near Roswell. Author Annie Jacobson claims to have evidence that the flying saucer that crashed at Roswell came from the Soviet Union. If the flying disc is an experimental Soviet spy plane, it would certainly make sense to send it to Roswell. Roswell Army Air Force Base is no ordinary base. It is the home of US Strategic Air Command. Operating from Roswell are America's nuclear bomb-carrying superfortresses. It's from Roswell that America has conducted atom bomb testing in the Bikini Atoll, just months before the sighting of the mysterious flying disc. According to Jacobson, the craft that crashed at Roswell supposedly had Russian markings on it, and supposedly also bore some resemblance to a flying saucer design that Hitler was rumored to have ordered during the war. Jacobson's theory is well argued, but for many, it's just a theory. The question remains, what really happened at Roswell that night? If it was a flying disc, was it a Soviet experimental craft built by their Nazi rocket scientists? Was it an American experimental craft built by their Nazi rocket scientists? Or was it something else altogether? 70 years later, the Roswell crash is still so iconic. After all the movies, after all the hype, after all the controversy, we will probably never know the truth. You can kill men with bullets and bombs, but there is no weapon yet invented that can kill a ghost. The plan is doomed unless the Allies can magic up a phantom army. A ghost army. Huge, terrifying and invisible. The Germans won't have a clue what hit them. Blitzkrieg. The devastatingly successful form of war pioneered by the German Nazis. Surprise attack, strike fast, strike hard. Blitzkrieg is great for invading a country, but it doesn't help you defend it. Germany quickly overruns mainland Europe. Now the problem is to hold it. The Western Front is especially vulnerable, and Hitler knows it. The Germans had over 10 million men in the field, but a large proportion of those men were fighting in Russia. And within Europe itself, a million men were fighting in Italy, hundreds of thousands were in Scandinavia. So Europe had to be protected with a limited force. It was a mammoth task. The Nazis have failed to knock Britain out of the war. 
They know it is just a matter of time before Britain and America decide to strike. In 1942, Hitler decides to erect one of the biggest defenses in human history. He builds the Atlantic Wall, a formidable series of defenses stretching from the Franco-Spanish border up to Denmark. It's one of the largest construction projects ever undertaken. 17 million cubic meters of concrete, a million tons of steel, hundreds of thousands of slave laborers, the French section alone costs four billion Deutschmarks to build. The cost is huge, and this is despite using slave labor to build it. Along the giant wall are hundreds of fortifications, tank traps, gun placements, bunkers, and lookout towers. The Atlantic Wall is defended with guns, with tanks dug in behind the wall, with millions of mines with names like hedgehogs, it's an understatement to say that the Germans want to keep the Allies out. It's a formidable defense stretching almost 2,000 miles, defended by 300,000 German troops, among them crack Nazi SS divisions. Churchill knows that any seaborne invasion is going to be unbelievably dangerous. If it's going to stand any chance of success, it has to be overwhelming and a total surprise. A surprise attack from a giant army. But that's the problem. The bigger the army, the less the surprise. Churchill and his American allies know that it takes time to assemble a giant army, and you can't do it without attracting attention. Hitler has spies everywhere. He's listening in to Allied communications. And big armies move slowly. If Hitler sees the army being assembled, he'll know where to place his defensive divisions. The Allies identify three locations that are close enough to Britain to launch a rapid attack. The Pas de Calais, the beaches of Normandy, and the Cherbourg Peninsula. The Allies decide to mount a concentrated attack on Normandy, D-Day. But the invasion will only succeed if Normandy is not heavily defended. Can they fool Hitler into moving the bulk of his defensive troops elsewhere? The obvious solution is to mount a dummy attack to distract the German forces. The problem is the plan needs at least two armies, and they only have one. But now British intelligence comes up with an idea. What if the Allies had a ghost army? A phantom army, huge and intimidating. An army that threatens to attack the Germans at a different point on the Atlantic War. But an army that, in fact, doesn't exist. British Prime Minister Winston Churchill and US General Dwight Eisenhower discussed the idea of summoning up a ghost army to draw attention away from the real point of attack. These leaders knew that these harebrained schemes could be the difference between winning and losing. The plan is approved and given the code name Operation Quicksilver. Making it happen falls to a special deception unit called R-Force. A phantom army is a work of fiction, and creating it will take imagination. So our force recruits the thriller writer Dennis Wheatley. And to make the phantom army more convincing, it's given a proper name. The first United States Army Group is created with the meticulous attention to detail that you would use to create a real army group. The Allies know that their radio communications are being intercepted so they start talking openly about the 1st United States Army Group, or FUSAG. This invented phantom army is given phantom divisions and battalions, each with their own insignia, movement orders and commanders, some of them real, but most made up. The ghost army is given a phantom base in the town of Dover in Kent, directly opposite the Nazi-occupied French Pas de Calais. It makes sense to invade Nazi-occupied Europe from here. It's the narrowest point in the English Channel that divides Britain from continental Europe. 
Attacking Calais from Dover seems like the obvious choice. It's just 20 miles across the channel. All Churchill has to do now is convince Hitler that the information he has is correct. How to create a giant army that isn't there. But an army you can see, an army you can hear. A giant phantom army. To make a phantom army, you need magic. Visual magic. And for that, the Allied generals turned to the movie makers. A great deal of effort was put into building a fake dock facility near Dover. And this was actually built by the set designers from Shepperton Studios. And it was opened by the king. In the southeast, fake landing craft were put all along the coast to make it look as if the troops were about to embark for the Partikale. Basically, the Allies started building a massive film set. Prop makers and special effects experts, who will later go on to make the first Bond movies, are set to work making phantom tanks, guns, trucks, and countless other objects. The Allies have wooden aircraft, artificial artillery, and from the air, it all looks real. When wooden vehicles are taking too long to build, the folk at Shepperton come up with a better idea. Highly realistic inflatable tanks and other vehicles can be produced quickly and in large numbers. There are hundreds of them. They can be blown up in 20 minutes and they could be carried by half a dozen Tommies. Imagine a vast armoured formation appearing before your eyes in 20 minutes. The tanks are so light they can be carried into position and then weighed down to stop them blowing away. And to make them even more convincing, fake tank tracks are cut into the grass behind them. Fake aeroplanes are created from tube frames and canvas. At night, vehicles are rigged up with lights to make them look like planes and driven up and down fake runways. During German bombing raids, fires and flares are lit to give the impression of burning vehicles. The sheer scale of the deception is breathtaking. From the air, this invasion has to look completely convincing. <laughs> Our force recruits whole banks of army radio operators. Genuine radio communications are studied and reproduced. The radio waves are swamped with phony conversations, which let slip details of the ghost army's supposed activities. Movements, supplies, vehicles, numbers and logistics. It's one of the laws of manipulation. If you want a story to be convincing, make sure it arrives from multiple sources. By January 1944, German radio interceptors are eavesdropping on 27 non-existent Allied divisions, talking about everything from tanks to toilets. The greatest military hoax in history has begun. To add the cherry on the cake, Allied High Command announces that the so-called First United States Army Group will be headed by the most feared general of his generation. US General George Patton is put in charge of the Phantom Army. The Allies then photograph him at the fake base and put the pictures in local newspapers. It's a masterstroke. For Patton, the creation of the Phantom Army gives him the perfect opportunity to regain the trust of his superiors. He had been sidelined from combat command for almost a year for causing a public outcry back home. In August 1943, he visited a series of military field hospitals and met several soldiers recovering from psychological problems brought on by the terror of war. These men were struggling with what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder, but without any physical symptoms, in Patton's eyes, they were simply deserters and cowards. One of the soldiers the general encountered was Private Paul Bennett, aged 21. Bennett was an artilleryman who had spent months firing shell after shell towards enemy positions. His doctor's report stated that he couldn't sleep and was constantly nervous, confused, and troubled by the shelling. Rather than take the word of the doctor who's standing there, Patton flies into an uncontrollable rage and he starts slapping the soldier and telling him that he's a coward. And he gives him two options. He can either return to the front line or he can face the firing squad as a deserter. 
Then Patton draws his pistol and tells the man that rather than waiting for the firing squad, he ought to shoot him himself. When the news reaches the American public, they are furious. This is a propaganda nightmare. The Americans are meant to be the good guys. They're not meant to be the ones abusing their own wounded. General Dwight Eisenhower relieves Patton of his duties, believing that he has become too undisciplined for a key role in the US Army. The Ghost Army is Patton's chance to redeem himself. Just beyond the White Cliffs of Dover, there are countless canvas planes, wooden guns and rubber jeeps, trucks and tanks. Fake barracks, airstrips, docks and other facilities. Scores of dummy officers are having dummy conversations about dummy troop movements. There are even rows of inflatable amphibious landing craft bobbing in the water. Meanwhile, along the English coast, preparations are well underway for the real thing. A vast Allied invasion force, its eyes set on Normandy. But is Patton's phantom army enough to convince Hitler that the Allies are planning to attack Calais? Hitler wants absolute confirmation that this huge army is for real. In January 1944, Nazi High Command contacts its most trusted spy operating inside Britain to find out more about this colossal new army in Kent. The spy's name is Juan Pujol Garcia, otherwise known as Agent Garbo. Garbo worked in Britain and he fed the Nazis with British troop movements, positions of ships and political developments. Garbo is Hitler's super spy. Hitler personally demands that he should be awarded an Iron Cross. Not only is Garbo a brilliant spy himself, he also claims to be running an extensive network of agents in Britain. German intelligence happily believe they've got a network of, of spies in Britain feeding them up-to-date intelligence. But there are two things Hitler doesn't know about his super spy in Britain. First, he's actually in Spain. And second, he works for MI5. The Spanish Civil War made the young Juan Pujol Garcia hate both the communists and the fascists. To help destroy the Nazis, he became what many regard as the greatest double agent in the history of espionage. And unfortunately for the Nazis, he wasn't the only one. One of the greatest success stories of the war is that the Germans thought that their spy networks in Britain were working for them, but in fact nearly every single one had been turned and was working for MI5. These turned spies turned out to be an astonishingly powerful weapon. We knew what the Germans knew, and we could tell them what we wanted them to know. Agent Garbo, Hitler's super spy, does not in fact have a network of agents in Britain. They are pure invention. But Garbo gets his phantom agents to spy on the Fusar ghost army, and he reports back to the Nazi high command that there is indeed a huge army amassing in Kent. When the Wehrmacht start piecing together the intelligence reports, they take it seriously. A gigantic force of 200,000 German troops are moved to Calais. Hitler is ready to defend against an attempted invasion by Patton's fearsome ghost army. Then finally, the day of the invasion arrives. D-Day, June the 6th, 1944. The Allies launch the largest seaborne attack in history, but it's nowhere near Calais. 5,000 ships, 11,000 aircraft, and 160,000 soldiers are heading at speed to the beaches of Normandy, 250 miles south of Calais. Now it's for Garbo to deliver his coup de grace, the death blow that will seal the fate of the Third Reich. He sends a long message to the Germans, telling them that the attack on Normandy is just a diversion, and that a bigger attack is coming, and it's coming in the Pas de Calais. Hitler has total faith in Agent Garbo. The Nazi high command decides that reports of enemy activity off the Normandy coast 
is just a ruse by the cunning General Patton. Hitler instructs the bulk of his forces to remain in Calais, keeping a careful watch on the assembled divisions, rubber tanks and wooden guns. Patton's phantom army causes two units to turn round once they'd set off to Normandy and makes others stay in the Pas de Calais. And if those units had actually made their way to help defend Normandy, then the outcome could have been very, very different indeed. Whole divisions of crack SS troops are sitting in Calais, their binoculars trained on the canvas planes and rubber amphibious craft sitting threateningly across the English Channel. Meanwhile, the Allies' real invasion force is beginning to pour onto the beaches of Normandy. In just a few hours, Hitler's monumental Atlantic Wall has been breached. The Wehrmacht is in a state of total confusion. Eleven months later, Berlin has fallen. Hitler is dead and the Allies have won World War II. A ghost army has won one of the greatest victories in military history. He is an international superstar and a national hero during World War II. Glenn Miller was the darling of the age, an allied musical icon loved on both sides of the pond. But on the 15th of December, 1944, just months before the end of World War II, Miller vanishes. Almost immediately, rumors start. That's just not how an international hero signs out. The official account of Miller's death is called into question by his own family. The theories range from the plausible to the preposterous, but some had the smell of truth about them. farm boy from Iowa who takes up the trombone and forms the most famous jazz band in history. By the late 30s, Miller is an international superstar. One of the best-selling recording artists in the world. Miller is even presented to the Queen. This guy was the Elvis of his day. At 38, Miller is too old to be drafted, but he still wants to do his bit. So at the height of his fame, he joins the army. He is put in charge of an army band and introduces the jazzed-up marching tunes which the US Army still uses today. Now Miller isn't just a musician. He's a weapon. He was already the world's most famous band leader, but now he's been elevated to patriotic hero. Images of Miller in his army uniform are a gigantic morale boost to Allied troops. They love the music, and they love the fact that superstar Miller is one of them. Miller's music lit up the war. From kitchens in Iowa to dance halls in Glasgow, the Glenn Miller sound was everywhere. But Miller's music is used as a weapon against the Nazis. The US Office of War Information broadcasts his radio shows across enemy lines. Miller was perfect propaganda material for the US government. Miller, who is said to have been of German descent, is immensely popular with the German troops to the fury of Hitler, who forbids them to listen to his music. Miller's relaxed swing represents everything Hitler hates. Freedom, individualism, the relaxed, open American way. In one lyric, he says, America means freedom. Towards the end of 1944, months before the end of the war, Miller is stationed in Europe, but on the 15th of December, he disappears. A 
According to official reports, Miller spent his last night in a stately home in England. The following day, he boards a plane at the RAF airfield at Twinwood in Bedfordshire with a senior officer and a pilot, and he heads for Paris. Paris had been liberated several weeks earlier, and the Allies are beginning to smell victory over the Germans. Miller and his band are to give a grand morale-boosting Christmas concert, and he is heading over for rehearsals. Miller boards a single-engine Norseman, a Canadian bush plane which is designed for extreme conditions, including the Arctic and Antarctic. According to official reports, the plane takes off at 1.53 p.m. As it crosses the channel, the plane flies into dense fog. Neither the plane nor Glenn Miller are ever seen again. 15th of December, 1944, is when the Glenn Miller story ends and the Glenn Miller mystery begins. The official response to Miller's disappearance is confused. US military command assumes that there has been a problem with the plane. Ice on the wings, perhaps, or engine failure caused by the cold. But Miller was flying a Norseman, a tough bush plane designed to withstand the harsh Alaskan winters. This plane faces far worse conditions in Alaska than it does on a foggy day over the English Channel. According to official accounts, a search party is sent out. It's unthinkable that they wouldn't have pulled out all the stops to find out what happened to him. But now the story gets strange. There is no public announcement of Miller's disappearance, and it's not until nine days later that his wife is told that he's missing. Paris is but a short flight away, so the alarm must have gone off that afternoon. Why did they take so long to go public? Members of Miller's own family have questioned the official explanation of his death. His younger brother, Herb, who was the manager of the Glenn Miller Band before the war, has insisted that Miller did not die in a plane crash. But then where did he go? A retired US Army Lieutenant Colonel, Hunton Downs, claims to know. A former colonel spends four decades looking into every single aspect of Miller's personal life and military career. His research takes him from America to Britain and on to Germany. According to Downs, the whole flight story is an invention. He claims that at the time of his disappearance, Miller was in fact in Europe, working as a spy for the Allies. According to Downs, Miller was sent behind enemy lines to make contact with high-ranking dissenters within the German army and political hierarchy. The men Miller was allegedly due to meet had been involved in attempts to assassinate Hitler. By 1944, various top secret operations were in place to bring an end to the war. But these generals needed to be won over to the Allies. Miller was a man they would recognize and trust. The Allies wanted to harness the power of celebrity. The Americans need someone the Germans know. Downs claims that Miller was captured behind enemy lines and died while under interrogation by the SS. The suggestion that Miller was working as a spy is not so far-fetched. A number of high-profile celebrities were involved in wartime espionage. The German movie star, Mylena Dietrich, who was enormously popular with German troops, worked for the American spy agency, the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, the direct predecessor to the CIA. Hedy Lamarr, considered by many the most beautiful actress of her generation, hosted parties for Hitler and Mussolini at her home in Austria. But Lamar, who was of Jewish descent, was secretly working against them and smuggled vital technical information to the Allies. Broadway sex symbol Josephine Baker also spied for the Allies. 
and even received France's highest military honours after the war. She would spend time at lavish parties with elite Axis leaders, including Italian dictator Benito Mussolini. But behind her seductive smile, the scantily dressed, fun-loving performer was actually a calculating, uncompromising spy. The OSS were using anyone they could. In a way, Miller was an obvious choice. So did Miller die in a cell at the hands of SS torturers? In 1997, a prominent German journalist claims to have been told what really happened to Miller by former members of the German intelligence service. According to Udo Ulfkotter, Miller's plane did land in Paris. But after it landed, Miller allegedly visited a Parisian brothel. And here it's claimed Miller suffered a fatal heart attack in the arms of a French prostitute. It's certainly a more pleasurable way to go than at the hands of the SS. But if this story were true, for a symbol of wholesome all-American values to die in the arms of a French tart would be a propaganda disaster for the Allies. Ulfkotter claims that the air crash story was concocted by the American Secret Service to cover up the seedy truth about Miller's demise. This is exactly the kind of bad propaganda that the Americans don't want. So they come up with the story of the plane crash and put that out instead. This would certainly explain why it took so long for Miller's disappearance to be reported. Ulfkotter says his information came from an off-the-record German intelligence source. The prostitute story could well be true, but he has not seen any supporting documentary evidence. Miller's younger brother, Herb, also claims that the air crash story was a cover-up and that Miller died of natural causes. But his account makes no mention of a prostitute. He says Miller's plane lands safely in France on the 15th of December, but the musician is taken ill on the flight and is immediately rushed to a military hospital. He says Miller was suffering from terminal lung cancer and died the next day. The plane crash story, it is alleged, was fabricated to make it seem that Miller died as a hero rather than gasping for breath in an army hospital bed. Glenn Miller was a chain smoker. And if he did die of cancer, this might explain a strange letter he wrote several months before he vanished. He states, I'm totally emaciated. I have trouble breathing. I think I'm very ill. Ten years after Miller's strange disappearance, Universal Pictures release a movie, The Glenn Miller Story, starring James Stewart and Jane Allison. Among the millions who see the picture is one Fred Shaw, a former RAF navigator. Shaw claims that it was watching the movie The Glenn Miller Story that he recalled a crucial event. When Shaw checks his old RAF logbook, he realizes that his Lancaster squadron jettisoned their bombs in exactly the location where Miller's plane supposedly vanished. Shaw was flying back to England after an aborted bombing mission over Germany. The navigator was part of a squadron of 139 Lancaster bombers. But before they could land in Britain, the planes had to jettison the bombs they had failed to drop. Jettisoning bombs means to drop the bombs into the sea on a return mission before you land. It's far safer to take off with an aircraft full of bombs than it is to land with one. A special area is designated for planes to jettison their bombs. All Allied shipping and planes are aware that it's a danger spot. As his aircraft is ditching its lethal cargo, Shaw recalls seeing something from the window. It is at this point that he claims to have seen a small plane about 2,500 feet below him, dangerously close to the drop zone. 
Shaw says he and other crew members observed the plane beneath them tipping over and spinning down into the water. Despite all that they had witnessed, the crew failed to report the plane's demise. After all, it was just another plane going missing in the chaos of the war. By cross-referencing the flight times of both Miller's Norseman plane and the Lancasters, it seems as though their flight paths could indeed have coincided. If war hero Glenn Miller was killed by Allied bombers, it would have been a catastrophic blow to Allied morale. It seems there are many possible reasons to cover up the real fate of Glenn Miller. Did he die grimacing at the hands of the SS? Did he die smiling in the arms of a French whore? Did he die coughing in a hospital bed? Or was he accidentally killed by the British? Or, as wild as speculation would have, was he abducted by swing-loving aliens? When heroes die suddenly, unexpectedly, we can't come to grips with that. We don't believe that's how our heroes should die. Whatever happened to Glenn Miller is still unknown.